This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. And to question ministers on such statements. Members are very welcome to this, the first meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The Committee will receive two statements today. A joint statement from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and then a statement from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Before I invite the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to give their statement, I think it would be helpful if I clarified some procedural issues relating to the operation of this committee. Members will have received a letter from the Speaker a short time ago to make clear that he is following advice to remain at home during, due to his medical history. Mr Speaker has therefore sent his apologies for not being here today as he had originally intended, and I am sure all members sent him their best wishes. I also want to apologise to members for the delay in getting their electronic packs to them. We had received the statement from the First and Deputy First Minister in time, but regrettably, we were still waiting for the statement from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. There have since been server issues with getting the packs issued to members, and as a result, we have had to email copies of the packs to members. The motion agreed by the Assembly provided that the Committee may not meet on days when the Assembly is sitting. Otherwise, the procedures of the Committee shall be as the Chair may determine. The Speaker, as Chairperson of the Committee, wrote to all members last week providing guidance on the procedures of this Committee. A copy of this correspondence has been included in the members' electronic packs at page 4. The guidance has also been published as an all-party notice on the Assembly's website and sent to all members. I do not intend to reiterate now everything that was included in that guidance. However, I do think it would be worthwhile if I clarified a few points. The central reason for the creation of the Ad Hoc Committee was to create a more flexible means for Ministers to give statements to the Assembly on days when there is no plenary session. The Ad Hoc Committee shall only be convened if a Minister wishes to make a statement on a non-sitting day. Obviously, we will require a reasonable period to give members notice and ensure the necessary arrangements and staffing structures are in place. However, as this mechanism has been developed as an agile means of responding to a fast-moving situation, I know that there may be times when it is necessary to convene this committee at short notice. The Ad Hoc Committee has come about following the Speaker's discussions with the junior ministers on behalf of the Executive. The Assembly has taken significant steps to ease pressure on departments at this difficult time, including the suspension of question time and the discouragement of Assembly written questions. However, the scrutiny role of this Assembly remains vital. This ad hoc committee provides the Assembly with additional flexibility through which it can exercise this scrutiny during this public health crisis. The Speaker has emphasised that it was important that the Executive take a coordinated pro approach to ensure that all ministers, all ministers use the ad hoc committee to provide regular updates to members on the Executive's response to COVID-19 and to take questions. I think that it is even more important, given the public announcements by ministers, that we are likely to be a, sorry, I beg pardon. I think it's even more important, given the public announcements by ministers, that we are likely to be approaching the peak of the pandemic that such work is undertaken. The Speaker had therefore made clear to the Executive that he expected to be required to convene meetings of the ad hoc committee in the short time ahead. I am pleased that the Executive has responded to this, and that, in addition to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister and the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs being here today, the Speaker's Office has also received indicative approaches from the Education Minister and the Communities Minister about coming to the next meeting of this committee. I should remind members 
that the committee can only receive statements from ministers on matters related to COVID-19 and the response thereto. The committee can conduct no other business than to receive these statements and to question ministers upon them. Consequently, members should not seek to raise points of order in this committee about matters which should instead be considered at plenary sittings or other committee meetings. I want this committee to remain entirely focused on the important business of the statements being brought before it by ministers. If members have other issues that they wish to raise, this committee is not the place to do it. Before we move on, I want to lay out for the I want to mention the layout of the Chamber for these committee meetings. Included in your packs at page 10 is a seating plan for the ad hoc committee meetings. This layout reflects the fact that these are committee meetings rather than plenary sittings. Ministers will therefore deliver their statements from lecterns on the Chamber floor in front of the Speaker's table rather than from their usual position on the benches. An advantage to this approach is that even with two ministers giving statements, there is still room for a further 22 Assembly members to be seated in the Chamber in a manner that upholds the social distancing requirements. I would remind members that as per the guidance issued by the Speaker last week, it is for parties to manage attendance at this committee in line with the seating arrangements and thus ensure appropriate social distancing. Let us move on. Agenda item two is a statement from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. The Speaker received notification on the 3rd of April that the Ministers wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of that statement that they intend to make is included in your pack at page 12. I would like to welcome the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to this first meeting of this committee. I invite them to use the lecterns to give their joint statement, which should be heard by members without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity to ask questions. I call the First Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I join with you in sending uh, best wishes uh, to the Speaker at this time as he self-isolates at home? I am grateful for the opportunity to update uh, the Ad Hoc Committee today. I recognise the critical role that the Assembly must play in responding to this crisis, and I am grateful uh, to you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and the Assembly for the flexibility you have shown in helping to accommodate the Executive at this time. It is important that we all work together to respond to the huge challenges that we face. All in this House, I know, will wish to join with me today in sending best wishes to the Prime Minister uh, for a speedy recovery at this time. It is the intention of the Executive, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, to keep the Assembly informed of our response to COVID-19. The Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs will make a statement later today. The Minister for Education and the Minister for Communities will give statements to this committee over the next few days, and the other Executive Ministers will also come before the committee on a regular basis. Before I update uh, on the executive work today, I would like to start by thanking all our healthcare workers for their courage, their compassion, their commitment, and their diligence in caring for all of us during these very difficult times. We are extremely grateful for the work of all of our doctors and nurses and everyone working in the health service from the laundry to the laboratory. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all the workers in other sectors who are making sure that there is still food on our tables, that the lights are on, there is clean water from our taps, our bins are being collected, and our key workers can get to and from their work, amongst many other essential tasks. The thoughts and prayers of all of us across this Assembly, of course, will be with the families and loved ones of the deceased. As of 11.15 a.m. on Tuesday, the 7th of April, testing has indicated that the total number of confirmed cases is 1,255. Our modelling indicates that the peak of the first wave of the epidemic is expected between the 6th and 20th of April 2020. Our key messages to the public are therefore more important than ever and remain the same. Please stay at home as much as possible. Observe social distancing in public 
and where a member of a household starts to show symptoms of COVID-19, self-isolate for 14 days. Now, we know that the majority of people are taking these measures seriously and doing all that they can to protect the NHS and help save lives. We will be asking that all to continue, and I want to get people to do the right thing this coming weekend and indeed over the Easter period. And we recognise that Easter is a time when many families would normally come together, but it is essential that everyone continues to follow the social distancing instructions as they did over Mother's Day. This will help protect those who are most vulnerable in our society, as well as those who are working so hard to look after our health. As an executive, we are continuing to do all that we can to work in a joined up manner to respond to the crisis. We have been working from home uh, and meeting virtually to ensure that we respect the rules on social distancing. We are engaging with our counterparts in both London and Dublin to ensure that every avenue is pursued in protecting our people, and we are also engaging further afield. The Deputy First Minister and I have had discussions with the Chinese Consul General, Madam Zhang Mifang, on securing more equipment to support healthcare staff and sharing medical expertise. As an executive, we have developed collective strategic priorities focused on looking after, firstly, the health and well-being of all our citizens, secondly, our economic well-being, both in the immediate and short term, and the medium to long term, and thirdly, the well-being of our community and society. We are keeping our priorities under constant review so that we can react quickly as the situation develops. In relation to our health and well-being, the concerns about PPE are being treated extremely seriously by this executive. The first batch of a fresh order from the NHS was delivered to Northern Ireland on Monday the 6th of April, comprising some 5.5 million items in total. This includes over 1.3 million aprons and over 300,000 FFP3 respirator masks. The remainder is expected in coming days. The extra 5.5 million items of PPE for Northern Ireland is very welcome news for our frontline staff. However, we know that we need to replenish and increase the stock that we hold, given the expected level of demand in the coming weeks. Efforts to support more PPE are continuing, and this is a constant focus of our executive meetings. The Minister for Health is actively working with the Minister of Finance to pursue all feasible supply routes both international and local, and it is, of course, a global challenge. Updated UK-wide NHS guidance on PPE use was issued last week, and this guidance will inform PPE use across our system and help us to prioritise distribution. I trust that this updated guidance, together with securing greater quantities of PPE for Northern Ireland, will play a part in allaying some concerns. We recognise that other sectors are also facing PPE challenges, and we have been considering their needs in our executive meetings and in our procurement efforts. I can assure the Assembly that there is no lack of urgency in this matter. We are doing everything we can to the best of our ability to get the right PPE to those who need it at the right time. I can also assure the Assembly that we are working equally as urgently on the important matter of testing. I am pleased to note that testing for healthcare workers has now commenced at the SSE arena. The Public Health Agency is involved in this testing initiative with input from the Health and Social Care Trust colleagues. This complements work undertaken by trusts to scale up their own testing capabilities. We will continue to expand the testing of healthcare staff as quickly as possible. We fully understand the frustration that more staff have not yet been tested both in the healthcare sector and, indeed, across other sectors. We understand that people are concerned about potentially unknowingly passing on the virus to their loved ones or those they are looking after. And we appreciate that people with COVID-like symptoms are frustrated at having to self-isolate while their colleagues are under pressure when the results of a test may have allowed them to go back to work. However, I can assure you that the difficulties in scaling up testing are not due to a lack of effort or will. There are significant challenges, including laboratory and staffing capacity, and the unprecedented levels of global demand for testing, reagents and swabs. 
So testing and PPE are two of the challenges that the executive are working tirelessly to resolve, and at the same time, we are facing multiple challenges across all departments. The Minister for the Economy has been working with the COVID-19 Engagement Forum to consider important social distancing guidance for our businesses. The Minister has also been working closely with the Minister of Finance to pay out grants to small businesses who are eligible for the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme. As of yesterday, 13,187 grants have been paid and 1,603 other applications were being validated. This will provide some much needed cash flow to businesses and I would, I would urge anyone who thinks their business is entitled to the payment but has not received it to use the online portal to register their details. Working closely with executive colleagues, the Minister for Infrastructure has made public transport free for all health and social care workers during this outbreak. This is a, a small gesture that will help make things a little easier for those who are on the front line in caring for us all during this pandemic. As we continue to support those who have been affected financially by this crisis, uh, the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has announced a substantial support package for our fishing industry to help the fleet survive this difficult period. And the Minister has also been considering the impact on the environment as he has established a COVID-19 waste group to provide support, guidance and regulatory direction to the waste sector who are providing us with essential services during this time. The Minister for Justice has been working closely with colleagues in the police service to ensure that they are able to continue to do their jobs. Now, the Deputy First Minister will provide a further update on some of these issues. Good last Can Corlia, and can I, just like Arling, um, send our best wishes to uh, the Can Corlia and wish him the very best in the time ahead. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to update members on our response to the coronavirus pandemic. As we all know, we're in the midst of the biggest challenge of our lifetime. It's causing um, loss of life and great hardship to many people throughout our society, right across this island, but also right across this world. The number of individuals tested for the virus is 9,158. The number of laboratory confirmed tests is 1,255. These figures relate predominantly to patients admitted to a HSE Trust Acute Hospital, so will be an underestimate, but as the testing strategy is rolled out, it will change to include those with the virus that are also tested in the community, of, what, of which we want more of, including our frontline uh, healthcare workers. Sadly, I can uh, report that as of 11.15 this morning, there have been 73 COVID-19 related deaths. And on behalf of us all in this assembly, I want to extend our sincere condolences to the family, to the friends and to the neighbours of those who have lost their loved ones. 73, 73 families find themselves in the most heartbreaking of situations. And then to compound that loss and their grief, they have to deal with the fact that they're not able to bury their loved ones um, in the way in which they traditionally do. Those who have passed on are not mere numbers. They are our grandparents, our parents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, the lives lost of who as a society we will remember and who we will never forget. To our nurses, to our doctors, to our healthcare workers in our hospitals and in the homes, the virtue of loving care for the sick and the vulnerable is remarkable and we are so, so thankful for all that you do. Each of us knows someone from our family, from our community who works in the health service. And we want you to know that we take huge pride in your professionalism, selflessness, courage and salute your fortitude and dignity in combating what is a deadly virus. I am sure, like many others, were struck last night when one of the news channels reported the, the plight of paramedics. And I believe the lady's name was Tina Marie, where she talked about, um, she was given an assurance to families and she said that if, I take, if we take your loved one out of your home, we can assure you that we will love them like our own. And I think that says it all in terms of the, the, the care that our healthcare workers are providing to those that we love. I have spoken to many frontline healthcare workers. You have said that you're frightened. You have said that you're worried about being able to do your job safely. You have said that you're worried for your families. But we want to say very clearly that we see you, we hear you, and we're working night and day to make sure you get the protection that you deserve. We can assure you that good progress is definitely being made in securing more PPE. 
and this remains a top priority for the Executive. We want to assure the public that the Executive is working tirelessly in our response to this pandemic. Our top priority has always been and always will be to save lives. Be in no doubt that while the five parties in our government coalition have a diversity of, of views, there is unity of purpose. No political, differences will will emphasis, or political difference of emphasis will interfere with the greater good of saving lives. This Assembly is a devolved administration, so we have the ability to adopt a regional approach which responds to our local circumstances. We have two jurisdictions on this island, but we are one island, and it makes sense that we have a common action to combat this deadly virus. The COVID-19 pandemic does not respect borders, so there must be a common approach to action in both jurisdictions on the island. I am glad, therefore, that a formal memorandum of understanding has been devised by the health ministers and the CMOs to focus our north-south cooperation, and I believe it's just been signed off in the last hour. Ministers across the island will meet in north-south format also on Thursday, again to discuss our, our approach to combat, combat COVID-19. The Executive has announced significant measures and interventions to help stop the spread of COVID-19, which have included everything from school closures, closing of non-essential businesses and services, and the introduction of regulatory powers and an enforcement regime to get people to stay at home. All social events are now banned, and public gatherings of two or more people, excluding households for essential work-related purposes, are prohibited. The Executive secured a budget totalling £912 million to secure the executive response to COVID-19, which has been used to resource our health service and provide substantial economic and social support packages to workers, households, the vulnerable and business community, and help to give peace of mind, relief and support to everyone's well-being at this very difficult and challenging time. This week is when the surge in the spread of cases will occur, and our plea is for people to live by the law, to stay at home, stop the spread, flatten the curve, to, and that's all about protecting our lives and our families' wellbeing. This weekend is Easter, and I know it's not going to be easy, especially with the weather being brighter, but people must continue to stay at home. People must listen and understand that this virus is spreading and it's killing people. But we all can do something about this. You must only go out of your home to shop for basic necessities, but only once a day at the most. To take exercise again, no more than once a day, and this should be done alone or with your household, not in groups. For medical reasons, for yourself or if providing care, for support for a vulnerable person. And to travel to essential work if that work is absolutely necessary and can't be done from home. There is evidence that a lot of people are listening. Road and rail traffic and key routes has fallen significantly. And this is encouraging, but we cannot let this slip, especially as we head into Easter weekend. I would also like to make a special appeal to our young people. I know how difficult it is to not be able to see your friends or take part in your normal activities. However, what you are doing is saving lives. I would like to record also our thanks for all the principals and the teachers who are going above and beyond in coming up with creative ways to help our children continue to learn at this time. Also to help in those of our key workers in providing care for their children. Arrangements have also been put in place to provide payment for 51,000 families, covering 93,000 children who would normally re uh, receive free school meals. The speedy implementation of this policy demonstrates the commitment of this executive to looking after those in our community who are vulnerable at this difficult time. The Minister for Communities and our department have been working hard to put in place measures to support and enable the voluntary and community sector as it seeks to mobilise and coordinate its response to the emergency. In recent days, Minister Hargey has announced the £10 million, uh, £10 million scheme to deliver food parcels to 10,400 homes, and that will begin this week. And that those who have been advised to stay at home due to underlying health conditions will be the beneficiaries. The Minister has also set up a free phone community helpline, and she will make a statement in the House this week to update members on those efforts. As the situation continues to unfold, our other executive colleagues will, be, will appear before this committee to provide detailed updates on their activities. We are working with leaders across the entire public sector, including local government, emergency services, private sector and community leaders. This is going to take a whole society approach. We are taking a smart, proactive and deliberate approach to resilience, which is about saving lives, livelihoods and people's well-being. Like everywhere else, the Executive has a very, very big challenge ahead of it, 
to reduce the risk to our people and to save lives, and we cannot do it alone. We have high expectations of ourselves, the public that we serve, to play our part in the weeks and months ahead, to help protect people's health and well-being and to the benefit of today's and future generations. Protection of the lives and the welfare of everyone on this island is paramount, and no effort will be spared in that regard. We will definitely leave nobody behind. Thank you. I thank the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister for making their statement. I will now invite members to ask the Minister's questions. I will allow a period of around an hour for this. It is my intention to allow all members to ask a question. However, this does depend upon members being focused and succinct in their questions. As is the case with questions on a ministerial statement at a plenary sitting, members should only ask one question, and this should relate directly to the minister's statement. If members ask multiple questions, then they should not be surprised or disappointed if the ministers only choose to answer one of them. The only exception in this meeting that I will make is in the case of the chair of the relevant statutory committee, that is Mr McGrath, who will be allowed some latitude to ask maybe two. <laughs> My munificence knows no limits. I would remind members that they must not preface their question with a speech. This is a matter of courtesy and respect to other members, particularly those from the smaller parties who are further down the speaking list. Finally, if members do ask short, focused questions, I may allow that member a supplementary if required, and if there is additional time left at the end, I may also allow some further questions. So the first person I call is the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'll try my best to stick to that uh, list of rules. Uh, and I join uh, in the remarks of the First and Deputy First Minister and extend best wishes to uh, Mr Speaker uh, and also to the Prime Minister Boris Johnson at this time and also to their families. It must be a very worrying time for them uh, and we extend uh, those thoughts. Um, First and Deputy First Minister, this is a defining time for our uh, community and they are looking to you for leadership and they are looking to you for direction. But I do have to say that if we continue to see a repeat of last week's uh, briefing against each other and scrambling to get uh, decisions issued by the party before the ministry or an attempt to orange and green or them and us, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, then people out there and many in here will, will not forgive you because um, this is, you have a job to do and we need to see that being done because that saves people's lives. Now, there is a lot of the um, response that has been taken that we will be praise, praising you for and thanking you for, but there is just one issue that I want to focus on uh, because some people out in the public think that it's not going too well, and that is the issue of PPE. Now, we are told that you're getting it right, and we've been told that you're getting uh, swathes of PPE from China, but the bottom line is that it is not going to the people that need it most. I mean, we're fast-tracking our students and we're bringing retired medics uh, back to the front line, but we're not preparing them for the dangers. And placing them at the front line without the necessary PPP, PPE is an unforgivable act. Now, uh, I have to ask, what about our, the, the, the yesterday's consignment of five million pieces, which we understand was for a hospital setting? So the questions that I have focus on, what about the frontline community services? our domiciliary cares in the community, uh, our community care sector, our nursing homes, our residential homes. Does the executive care about the staff there and their safety? Um, I want to give an example that I had heard yesterday of key community uh, health working staff who were forced to come into a shared office. Now, they could have worked at home, but they were asked to come in and work in their office. Um, there was about 25 of them in that shared office. They were social workers, district nurses and others. They had little to zero PPE because apparently they were told that they don't need it. 13 of them 25 individuals are now self-isolating because they have symptoms of coronavirus. So First Minister, Deputy First Minister, I don't want any polished, pre-prepared answer that's in your pack. I want you to tell me this. Can you look them in the eye and say that you have done everything for them that you can? Do you value these staff and their contributions so much 
that you send them out to work afraid and scared because they don't have the correct PPE. Ministers, today, what is your message to them, our community nurses, our healthcare staff? Thank you. Well, I'll go first. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure Michelle will want to add her perspective on this. Um, I mean, Colm, you've obviously come uh, with a very clear question uh, around asking us and the rest of our executive colleagues, do we care uh, about our domiciliary care workers? My goodness, what a question to ask. We spend every single day caring about our domiciliary care workers, our health care workers, our police officers, our prison officers, which is why we have put such an emphasis, such an emphasis on personal protection equipment. Every single executive meeting, of which there's three a week now, most of it is spent talking about personal protection equipment. And that is because we have heard, as indeed all of the other members of this chamber has heard uh, from their constituents, from people such as you have mentioned, that they are frightened, that they are concerned, that they don't have the appropriate level of, of personal protection equipment. And this is something that we have been working very hard on with the Minister of Health. Uh, as a result of that, um, you have seen uh, the PPE come in yesterday. That is only the start. And you have rightly uh, indicated that that was identified uh, for hospital settings. But, uh, but as I understand it, uh, that will be distributed to the trusts. And then the trusts will then filter it down to everyone else within their remit, which includes the independent sector and includes domiciliary care workers. Now, I know uh, that there has been some concern expressed uh, that when it gets to trust level, that it isn't being further distributed to the people that need it. And we have heard that very clearly about different wards and different hospitals not having the appropriate PPE, about care homes not having the PPE. Uh, and that matter has been raised with the Minister for Health, and he has told us as of yesterday that he is putting in um, an audit team to look at the trusts as to how they're distributing that um, uh, uh, work. Because there's no point in having a central store of personal protection equipment if it's not getting out to the people that need it. And we recognise that, but I think yesterday was an important step to have that um, delivery from the UK government, from our National Health Service, was important. Because up until then, um, I think people were concerned. We had got a briefing at the executive um, on Friday about what we ha actually had physically in our stores at that particular point in time. So we knew what we had in reserve, uh, and we also knew that that would have to be replenished. So we were pleased to see that coming in early on Monday morning, and there is more to come as well uh, from UK government, as well as local suppliers who are really stepping up to the plate. Very pleased to see it offering their services and really I think we should be very proud of the number of people that have come forward and have heard the call both in their own areas and indeed uh, regionally in Northern Ireland as well. Mr Concur, I mean of course we value um, each and every one of those people that work on the front line for us right now. We need them more than ever. We're actually, I think after all of this we'll have a conversation about the type of society that we value and the type of society that values those people that we depend on so much now. Domiciliary care workers, the lowest paid probably workforce out there, um, predominantly female workforce, who already were faced very, very challenging circumstances um, in terms of cuts across health. So I think that these are the people that we are now relying on, but they need to have confidence that they can go to work and do their job and feel safe for, for themselves, for their families, and also for the people that they care for. So um, people should be assured that it is the executive's priority to make sure we get every single piece of PPE that we can get our hands on and get it right out to who needs it. Because I think where the disparity has been is that you can say we have this stock, but that is not the reality of what people see on the ground. That's not the reality of, of, of um, what our healthcare workers are telling us is, the, is their experience. And that's not just in a community setting, that's also in the hospital setting. And we're all probably fielding questions from healthcare workers who have that real lived experience. So we've put a lot of focus on this in the executive and we've had considerable in-depth conversation around all of this. And I welcome the fact that the health minister is now looking at how can you actually make sure that, it's that, that whenever we have a large delivery of PPE and a health trust says that they have sufficient stock, why is that not the reality on the ground for staff? So the fact that there's going to be a mechanism put in place that now actually looks at that is a welcome development in the right, in the right um, direction. And I think that should give some assurance to staff that that's um, where that's moving. We are chasing um, all different avenues for PPE. 
um, both from the British government, um, from China, obviously, because that's the other area where we are um, trying to establish a supply chain, and then local companies. And I can't remember the exact figure, but I think it's over 100 companies have come forward um, and have actually said that they're prepared to repurpose what they do. And orders have been placed across uh, our whole range of companies who provide a whole range of things that we need, not re need, need right now, um, PPE, but then other things as well. So based on the recent modelling, it looks now that we're going to be potentially facing a second uh, surge. And if that is the case, and we have another peak, then we need to be preparing for so now, and then what's coming down the line. That's why our local companies are going to be really, really important in terms of that preparation um, as well. But the, the staff on the, on the ground, the staff who are working for all of us, for our families, for, for our loved ones, for our communities, for our people, need to know that we're doing everything we can to get them what they need, and that is our uh, determination. Thank you. Before I call the next person um, to ask a question, I would remind members uh, Mr McGrath got a bit of leeway. The era of indulgence is now over because there's 19 people on the speaking list and people want to get asking a question. Mr Paul Given. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, can I welcome this engagement and the accountability that the Executive Office are giving and the, the work that the Assembly has done to, to set this up? Um, can I also thank the, the First Minister for the very assured way that she's went about her business? The, calm way, uh, but recognising the seriousness of what needs to be done, and also ensuring a, a collective approach is taken, and her as First Minister giving leadership uh, in the executive and publicly, and I want to put that on the record, my appreciation for the way that uh, you, First Minister, have carried out that business. Uh, in terms of collaboration across uh, the executive, wider into the industry and academia, uh, and the north-south connection and the collaboration east-west, First Minister, could you elaborate a little bit more just on how that collaboration is seeking to provide the solutions to the many problems that we're having to deal with in the face of this difficulty? Yes, so um, I think when you come to a time of crisis, um, there are always some people who really do step up to the mark, and we have seen that uh, right across the community um, since this terrible virus has taken hold. Um, to the amount of volunteers that have come forward to um, the NHS volunteer, uh, former nurses, former doctors, volunteering to come back in to what is, uh, I think we all recognise, a frightening prospect for them. Um, you will know, Paul, that one of our own colleagues, Catherine Owen, has come back into nursing again. She was an auxiliary nurse and has come back in again. I mean, that's a really brave thing to do, and uh, I really do commend everyone uh, that has done that. And as well as that, of course, under the Minister for Community, she has set up a, a Volunteer Now portal, uh, and people can register there to come and volunteer uh, in other ways. But as well as that, we've seen uh, a great collaboration between industry, between academia, uh, people wanting to come to us in government and say, how can we help? Um, and there is a consortium, including Queen's, the, the Ulster University, Citric up in Londonderry, and AFPE. Uh, that's looking at how they can scale up diagnostic testing, for example. Uh, Randox and Deloitte uh, are looking at a, a UK-wide initiative on staff testing, and the SSE arena is part of that UK-wide staff testing piece, so that, that's really good to see that. Uh, the Deputy First Minister has already mentioned that uh, there's a memorandum of understanding now between the two chief medical officers in the Republic of Ireland and here in Northern Ireland. And that, again, is about sharing information, um, looking at modelling, how we can model. Because I think what's really important is to look at the data that we are gaining um, from industry, uh, from colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, colleagues in uh, Great Britain, and indeed here in Northern Ireland, across all of our departments at the moment. And this is a very interesting point that I, I'm not sure members will be aware of, but all of our departments are gathering data then putting it into our central hub in the civil contingencies group, uh, and then that is informing how we move forward. So all of that data analytics is very important now as well. We are in the age of technology, and so we're using that. We're looking at our own modelling, and we were very pleased when the Minister of Health brought forward um, his mo the modelling for Northern Ireland recently, and uh, the Deputy First Minister and I had Professor Ian Young with us at a press conference just last Friday, um, and he was able to tell us how that modelling works. It's happening all the time, will be revisited, so they'll look at live data and say, well, how is that changing what's happening in Northern Ireland? So there's a lot of work 
going on behind the scenes um, that doesn't get talked about very much in the public domain. And I can understand, going back to the last question, why PPE is such a critical issue. But there is so much other work going on behind the scenes which informs everything that's happening at the moment. Can I just, just to add, I suppose, um, I think the people that are stepping up to the mark are the amazing healthcare staff. And that's why uh, it's so important that we support them now as best as we possibly can by chasing down every bit of protection that we possibly can, that we get them the testing which they deserve, because this is both in terms of their own um, health and uh, assurances, but also it's about trying to keep our healthcare staff in work as, uh, as we work our way through this um, crisis. So I think that uh, we all can attest to brilliant examples of community development, people who have stepped up to the mark right across our communities to support those who are most um, vulnerable in our society. And can I say, in terms of um, leadership of this crisis, I mean, myself and uh, Arlene, the First Minister, sit every morning in a CCG meeting, Civil Contingencies Group meeting. Um, that brings together all the government departments, it brings together all our emergency responders, it brings together local government, and it's about how do we work collectively to provide leadership through this crisis. It's where things are escalated that need to be escalated. It's where we take, uh, we, we're informed in terms of all the modelling work. It's where we're informed in terms of all the statistics that are being gathered, particularly around um, how the measures which have been implemented, what impact that's having, for example, on the levels of traffic coming down, the, the number of people that are actually going out. And all these things are going to keep informing the decisions that we take, because as we move through the next weeks and months ahead, and this could go on, as the Chief Medical Officer has said, for some time, um, albeit in different phases, but as we move through this, we have to be informed by the best statistics in terms of um, what are the right measures to take, when are the right measures to take, and um, how do we implement them. So that work is an ongoing piece of work and a very valuable piece of work. Call Mr. Declan. Uh, I'll and um, I thank the ministers for their uh, statement. The minister is uh, satisfied that the public uh, information campaign has been heated and actually leading to a reduction in day-to-day -day contact between people and hence reducing the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. Just to say that so we, we brought forward a very um, informative public information campaign. I hope people see that. I mean, it's very clear and concise in terms of what the message is that we're trying to um, put out there. So it's TV, it's radio, it's newspapers, it's using social media, it's driving home the message about staying home, washing your hands. Um, and I think that that's been fairly effective. A lot of the information that we're getting back suggests certainly that it is. But again, to use this platform, this weekend is Easter. It's not a holiday weekend like any other um, time, and people need to please um, listen to that advice. We know that the PSNI, for example, are out and about um, asking people why they're on the roads and you know, making sure that they, they, they're not out if they don't need to be. And that needs to be con uh, continued over this weekend. But just please, to the public, keep doing what you're doing. This is us fighting to save people's lives and we all need to play our part in that. I think um, we were heartened by the fact when we, uh, back to the data again, if you'll forgive me, when data came in from TransLink to say the number of journeys had fallen significantly um, during the first week that the regulations took an impact um, in terms of uh, rail travel, in terms of bus travel. I, I think the roads were a lot quieter. Um, I do agree with the Deputy First Minister though that it's critical that we don't lapse back um, on that issue because I think some people are taking the attitude, well, we've done two weeks at home, surely that's enough. Well, it's not enough. Uh, and this is really, really important that people, even though this is Easter weekend, even though it is a time when we would normally be enjoying outdoors or with family or, or celebrating that actually people need to stay at home and not be out and about. And uh, that's really important for us. And I just would really put a plea out that they don't lapse back on that. And I hope that our information campaign, which now has gone live, uh, as the Deputy First Minister has said, um, does have an impact and points out that we all have to do it to get through it. And that's true. We all have to do it. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd may I thank the First and Deputy First Minister for their comments. And may I, on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party, pass on our uh, regards both to the Speaker and also to wish the Br British Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, a very swift recovery. And I also note the numbers of deaths we have had today, and we again pass on our condolences, as I imagine as we do for everybody in this House to this position. But I have a specific question to the Deputy First Minister. 
and it is an issue to do with last week. And when she talks about PPE, there is an issue when she was talking specifically about the Health Minister that on Thursday evening ref- refused to give her full hearted support to the Health Minister. Bearing in mind that in this House last week we had the Finance Minister come and speak to us, who informed us that not only was PPE on its way from a joint order with the Irish Republic, that it was due to arrive shortly in significant quantities. It now transpires that not only was there not an order not made, there was no details of this order, there was no details of timing. And what I would like to hear, Deputy First Minister, Do you have any faith and confidence in your finance minister, who at best misrepresented this House? And do you have faith and confidence in the health minister, who has done an absolutely sterling job with the rest of the Northern Ireland Health Service and all the health workers to deal with this crisis? Over to you, Deputy First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say that I have confidence that everybody in the executive is doing everything that they can to save lives. The number one priority here is about saving lives. I have said that in, in the past that I believe if there is a difference in emphasis, then that is what we should say. That does not mean that we do not have a unity of purpose. That does not mean that we are trying to do everything that we can to make sure we protect lives and do the very best by people in what is the most unprecedented of circumstances that none of us have ever been through before. So I encourage the member to keep faith. We are going to con- continue to work together. The Finance Minister has, uh, has said uh, very clearly on the record, and he will continue to say it, and I believe he is going to come to your committee because you have asked him to come on Wednesday. Uh, and he has said he is not going to be apologetic for trying to get PPE. Let us just continue to do everything that we can to go down our three routes of supply, making sure we use whatever or get whatever we can in terms of the British Government, make sure we supply uh, or get our supplies from China where we can, and make sure we work with our local suppliers. We all need to work together, but we also have to have the space, because we are a five party coalition, to have the space to be able to say things whenever we think things are slow. So um, I have confidence in this executive. And I have confidence in the fact that actually over the course of the last number of days and even in the last week that we have actually made progress. We have made progress on testing. We have made progress in PPE. That is what the public want to hear. We need to get these things right as best that we can in the most challenging of circumstances. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I would just like to start off by saying on behalf of the Alliance Party um, our sincere condolences to those who have lost their lives to this terrible um, pandemic that is going on at the moment. Our thoughts, of course, are with the Speaker and the Prime Minister. And to all those families, including my own, who have not been able to attend funerals, um, it is a devastating time. One of the things that has come forward is the fact that our executive is working hard and I would like to take the opportunity, you will probably not hear this too often from me, to say to both the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, thank you and to all the ministers. We are facing a crisis and thank goodness we are back and able to um, work forward through this. Um, One of the things I am very aware of, and in fact this morning I was part of a a discussion with Comres about um, the state of the UK with regards to this pandemic and what the effect that it is having not only on businesses but in individuals and one of the thing that ha- one of the things that has come very clear is people need peace of mind and the, the deputy first minister has mentioned this already today so in order to get that peace of mind there are certain things i am going to ask you slight list, but it is all tied in together just on clarity. For example, do we know the financial assistance has been agreed yet for childcare provision? Has that come through the executive? We know that we are depending on the detail of the Budget Act in order for the welfare mitigations to be paid. When will we see that welfare mitigations um, legislation coming through? The £25,000 business grant is something that our businesses desperately need. And I have to make a very clear call out for constituencies like mine that are holiday places. Um, I have caravan parks where people are trying to get around the legislation by claiming that that's their permanent um, place of residence. And it's bringing tourists to areas where we definitely do not need them. Any other time I'd be saying tourists, please do come to the Arts Peninsula. But now I'm saying please stay at home because you're putting at risk those very vulnerable older people in villages and coastal areas. So I would ask you, ministers, if you can give us any further um, clarification on those points and I would like to wish you both, because I will not get to ask this again, um, a very happy Easter and I hope that we are all back to this chamber together as 90 again. Thank the member for her uh, comments and happy Easter to her too and indeed to to the whole House. Um, In terms of the specific issues, um, the financial assistance for childcare, I understand there is a paper 
that is to come to the executive. As I said, the executive is sitting three times a week now, so it's hard to keep a track of all of the papers that are, that are coming, but I understand there's a paper coming on that very soon. Uh, the welfare mitigation uh, paper is at the executive and uh, is still undergoing discussion, but is still rolling out over the period through the Budget Act. Uh, the 25,000 payment, as I referenced, the 10,000 payment, which is going very well, and that was because we had the data in the LPS, as she will know. Um, I understand that the 25,000 um, grant is hopefully going to be. Um, I think the economy minister said to me she hoped to have a process in place by the end of this week. Um, she's working very hard on that with the finance minister to try and get that actioned. Because, look, I recognise um, it's one thing to announce support packages, it's quite another to get the money out. And I think we have all heard from individual uh, business people around the fact that they have cash flow difficulties at the moment. I recognise that. Uh, I have urged the banks to work with them uh, and not be looking for fully developed business plans in order for them to access funding. Um, so I think that is important. We are also aware that there's a gap. There are some people that are not captured by some of the schemes. Um, and again, uh, we're hearing all of that and we're trying to process how we can help those people. Uh, and then very lastly, of course, people should only be in caravan parks if that's their main residence. They should not be designating it themselves. Um, in other words, and we've seen the difficulties that unfortunately the Chief Medical Officer in Scotland got into um, in relation to going to a second home. People should not be travelling to either their second home or their caravans. I know it's difficult and I know the normal thing at Easter time is to go to your caravan or to your second home, uh, but frankly our priority is saving lives and uh, if they have to stay away at this time I would ask them to consider other people. Just, just to briefly um, add to that, well, firstly, I, I didn't know you had lost someone, so condolences to yourself and to your family um, at this time. Um, we can ask uh, the Minister for Communities just to give you a definitive update just in terms of the question you asked um, in terms of the, the welfare mitigations. And the other thing just to add to what uh, the First Minister has said is that we're examining the possibility of extending the business support to businesses who have an NAV of under 15,000 because that's been an issue, particularly for small businesses who have been left out of the current category. So. We're conscious of the fact that the schemes are being brought forward whilst welcome. Um, there are um, areas where some people have been left out, and we're, we're making the case to Treasury around those things um, in a joined up executive way. Call Mr. Gordon, Don. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too would like to thank the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister for their commitment and leadership that they have shown. I think it is important in the time of crisis that we all work together in a united, uh, strong voice and uh, for all of the people out there, all of them. And I think we all recognise the good work of local business, and this has already been mentioned. But there is a, a, a sector, the small business manufacturing sector, who unfortunately uh, have not been recognised, those that are in, in a receipt of industrial derating at the moment do not seem to be uh, included. So I would again stress the need for to get some funding in place for this group. I think we all recognise the great work that industry has done in diversifying, stepping up to the plate, restructuring their business to meet the demands of the crisis. Uh, that's precisely one of the groups that we feel uh, haven't been covered. Um, I think some of them felt they were covered under the small business, the 10,000, and then they realised because they were, we were using the small business rates relief. Um, uh, as the passport, if you like, to the 10,000 that they missed out because they were beneficiaries of industrial derating. So I know that this is something that the Minister of the Economy has opened up with the Minister of Finance. Um, so we're trying to find a way forward on that. I mean, it is critically important um, that we do find a way forward on that because there are many people who it would benefit. But I do, I do also say to members that whilst we have um, been beneficiaries of, I think it's, what did you say, 912 million in terms of uh, this virus from Westminster. We also benefit, obviously, from the UK wide schemes, which don't impact on our block grant. Um, and if we can do something on a UK wide basis, then it won't impact on our, the money that we hold here. It comes from Treasury. Uh, and we're trying to encourage Treasury to look at some of these gaps as well. But the industrial derating one is being looked at, and I want to assure you of that. 
just before the Deputy First Minister rises or, or maybe doesn't rise, it's obviously up to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to decide if they want to both have a go at a, at a question. Um, but it just means it, it makes it more difficult to get to the end of the list. So um, I'll just... Mr. Pat Sheehan. I got a free last concourse. I got speak a selection virtuara a sector righteous. I got a good fragri and you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thanks to both ministers for their statement and their answers thus far today. Uh, the, the recent modelling that was produced by the um, the uh, scientific officer, the chief scientific officer, uh, Professor Young indicated that the health service has a realistic prospect of dealing with this initial period, uh, particularly between now and the uh, 20th of April, and particularly if people adhere to the social distancing and self-isolation uh, measures. Yet it still assumes an admission of up to 500 people uh, per week uh, to the hospitals. Uh, is there, in your view, uh, uh, sufficient resources being given to the health service in terms of uh, their ability to provide personnel, uh, beds and ventilators and so on? I'll, I'll take that question just to say yes and in terms of the modelling that's been done, it's been really useful just to, to, to delve into that, particularly because we're doing our own modelling now and we're looking at looking at that and, and we're going to actually have a, an update on that I think over the course of the next number of days because that is what determines what we do next and when we do it and why we take these measures that um, that we're having to take and we have to keep reminding ourselves that these are extreme measures what you're asking people to take to stay apart from their families like that's just not not easy and it's not the norm and um, so we have to keep con uh, under review that we're doing the right things at the right time and um, that modelling works really really important we also know that they're going to look at um, so what does it look like in terms of the north, but also looking at it uh, north-south in terms of the model that's been used there, because obviously um, the disease knows no, bar no barriers, and I think it's important that we watch those things on, a, on an ongoing basis. In terms of the, the, the resource that you posed, the question around resource, does the health department have enough money? Money isn't the, op isn't the issue here. We have said that we will find whatever is required. Um, I think one of the very first things that the finance minister said to the to all departments in one of our early executive meetings was to throw the rule book out the window. This is not normal times. We as an executive can't behave like normal. Um, our departments shouldn't behave like normal. And one of the things that I think that was warmly received in terms of uh, us being able to respond in a very agile uh, and fast manner to the issues that are presented to us. So um, there, I think in terms of resource, uh, the, the, the finances aren't the issue. Um, there's a lot of issues in terms of capability and, uh, and in the health service, what we can do and when we can do it. And those are the things that need to be invested in. Um, in terms of personnel, I mean, the, the call for healthcare staff to come back uh, into the workforce across every discipline has been absolutely incredible. I can't remember what the latest figure is, but I think it was 14,000 um, the last um, time that we were updated. Uh, maybe that was yesterday. So that, that shows the level of support out there that whilst people are afraid and perhaps have stepped out of the profession, have retired uh, and not, whatnot, but the fact that all those people are coming back even in the midst of the most challenging of circumstances, shows the kind of society we have, the kind of people that we have that actually want to do their, play their part. So I think that that's certainly a very um, positive thing that we have so many people coming forward. So resource shouldn't be the issue. Um, whatever we need, whether it be PPE, ventilators, um, whatever equipment is required, um, we have to find the money for those things. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the First and Deputy First Minister and all the Executive Ministers for the work uh, that they're doing at this very difficult time. Uh, I, I too welcome the work with uh, local businesses and local communities and what they're doing to, to rally around and produce uh, PPE equipment and hand sanitizer as well. Uh, would the First and Deputy First Minister confirm that in working with the UK Government uh, at the national level, are they fully aware and understanding of the need, uh, specifically for Northern Ireland, not only in terms of PPE, but also in terms of ventilators and other equipment as well. Okay, um, and thank the member for his question. And you're absolutely right about our local producers. It's not just uh, around PPE and indeed scrubs and uh, everything that's necessary there. But in terms of some of our local distillers, they are 
Uh, instead of making gin, they're making hand sanitizers, and it's been quite incredible to see the way in which people have repurposed their businesses um, over this past number of weeks and, and really quite heartening. Uh, in terms of our input into uh, Westminster, there is a, a ministerial implementation group that takes place every single day, um, which our ministers are involved in depending on the subject matter. So today, um, the issue was around freight and transport uh, and food supply. Uh, and as I understand it, the junior ministers uh, are usually there all of the time. And then um, the economy minister and the infrastructure minister, and I think the agriculture minister was on that call as well. So there is very much a good flow of information uh, between ourselves and Westminster, uh, and therefore I would very much say a very good understanding. I have to say uh, that last week, in terms of the PPE, both the Secretary of State for Health and the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland were very helpful in making sure that that PPE was delivered on time. Uh, and we do thank them for the work that they're doing on our behalf as well. And thank you to both ministers for your answers here today and presentations. Um, and I do uh, welcome also the delivery yesterday of upwards of five, five million items of PPE. I know it's been discussed here already, but I would uh, like to recognise that the First Minister acknowledged that that needs to be replenished on an ongoing basis. And I would therefore like to welcome the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding, which opens up further channels and also um, potential sharing of resources. But I would, also, I would also like to ask specifically, what mechanisms, or can you outline what mechanisms are in place to ensure that the PPE which has arrived is delivered to frontline staff on an ongoing basis as and when they need it? So, um, yep, um, can I welcome the member back into action? Because I know he was out of action for 14 days. Um, can, I, can I firstly say, see, that's the, that's the point that, that um, is. I think all, all hard for us all to fathom the fact that we on one hand have um, this PPE but it's not the reality for, for staff on the ground and that's, that's where, where that, that uh, falls down. So I, think, I welcome the fact that yesterday um, as part of our discussions around PPE that the Health Minister has said I had suggested could you use for example RQIA as a, as a, as a way to go and investigate but um, he thinks that it's best to bring in an independent assessor so some uh, individual or group of individuals who actually can assess what is the reality on the ground for staff and have an engagement with staff. So I think that should go some way to give an assurances that actually staff know who they can talk to uh, and know, know where they can go to whenever they are not getting the protection which they um, feel that, that they need. So I think that will be a significant development in terms of giving the, the staff the assurance that they need. Thank you. I call Mr Matthew O'Toole. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I associate myself with all the others who have paid tribute to our frontline staff. Um, what can you say except we are all humbled and grateful beyond words for the sacrifices and dedication that they are showing on our behalf? It, it's, um, there's really not much more you can say other than to thank them. Um, the specific question I want to ask is to go back to what both of you have talked about, which is around data and the importance of data and Northern Ireland specific data and getting and also sharing data that's useful from GB and from the rest of Ireland. I want to ask about that and I want to ask about whether thought has been given, while we are all rightly now focused on the next few weeks, making sure people stay at home, making sure our healthcare staff have the maximum support in terms of dealing with this first wave, it isn't irresponsible to think about how, this we, how we exit from current arrangements and then how we manage what the Deputy First Minister has already said will be a second surge, which we hope is lower than the first, but will be a second surge. Part of that surely will be through extensive contact tracing and testing. It has thought been given to the very specific circumstances that exist in Northern Ireland. Both of you will have probably come from your constituencies west of the ban and noticed that we are a much, much more rural place than, um, than in GB. What specific thought and modelling is going into how that mass contact tracing, contact tracing and testing can be delivered in Northern Ireland in a way that helps us remove ourselves from the current restrictions and then manages the next surge? Absolutely, you're right. So I think that we can all note that there has been progress in terms of testing. Um, we know that the, the best evidence out there across the world is that this is where we need to be, but not just testing by itself. Um, it's testing, it's isolating, it's tra tracing and isolating. Um, and those three things are key component parts to us being successful. So we have now, as an executive, received an, uh, a testing strategy, 
which will be populated then in terms of what the, the, the numbers that we wish to see, and some of the things over the weekend. So the SSE arena being opened up is a positive step in the right direction. But there are, you know, people who live west of the ban are not going to travel to Belfast to get their tests, and we need to be able to have that closer to, to home for people. So I welcome the fact, again, that other areas were being explored, and we now also have DV, or MOT centres also being used as a potential venue. So that gives us plenty of opportunity right across the north to provide um, maybe two, three um, of these centres um, for testing. But key to our success um, in all of this has to be um, following the best evidence, and the best evidence says that we must do not just the extreme measures, but alongside that, we must do the test, um, isolate and trace. And I, I'm, I think that uh, there's certainly been a lot of progress over recent days on those things. But I think what we now need to quickly move to, and we are working uh, on this, is that we get to the point where, when we say we're rapidly scaling up tests, and what does that look like in terms of numbers? How, who are we going to reach? So some of the work that's been done is around how do you increase the tests for healthcare workers? How do you widen that out then to other people who are in the front line? So everybody from um, our, our emergency responders, obviously in the health service, but also the PSNI and people who work in prisons, you know, everybody else who's out there on the front line. Um, so there's work being done around how, uh, how we can work our way um, through that. You know, there's the issue that's been raised quite often around testing in, in um, community care homes, residential homes. Those things all need to be part and parcel of the rollout um, plan, but I'm certainly... Um, content that there's been progress made on these things and it's exactly around uh, moving towards the position which uh, best evidence says where we should be. Mr. Uh, my question is about the Health Minister. Um, I've worked with Robin Swan since we campaigned to get elected to this House in, in 2011. Um, I could say I would trust him with my children's lives, but actually I am trusting him with my children's lives. So I would like the two ministers to tell me whether they agree that any public attack on his motivation or his integrity or his ability is not only unwelcome, it's, it's just wrong. And the Deputy First Minister quoted Tina Marie, the paramedic, who said, if we take your loved one out of your home, we can assure you we will love them like one of our own. Isn't that the spirit the public want to see emanating from this chamber, from this house? Right. Loving each other might be a bit of a stretch, <laughs> but for God's sake, we need to show each other respect. Here, here. Um, can I say to the member, I have nothing but respect for his colleague, and I work very closely with him. Um, I think he would say that I have been incredibly supportive of him because I know the incredible job that he has. Um, and we said, I don't know whether you will recall, but before the Westminster election, I was asked a question about the health minister, whoever that would be, and I said, I couldn't care who the health minister is in the next executive, I will support them. Because at that time, they had an incredible pressure uh, in terms of healthcare workers. Do you remember the strikes were ongoing? There were issues around the crisis in our health service. Little did we think that we would be dealing with a global pandemic coming to Northern Ireland at that particular point in time. So I will, of course, continue to support Robin in the very difficult job that he does. We have said to him uh, in the executive that this is not just a crisis for health, it's a crisis for the whole of society in Northern Ireland. Therefore, it is a crisis for the whole of the executive. Uh, and we very much recognise that. And I think that he is continuing to do a very good job under pressure that no one should have to face. And let me take the opportunity again to completely condemn the sectarian vile attack that was directed at him and his family on Friday. Um, when I seen the details of that, I have to say uh, I was outraged, and let's be honest, I've seen many a threat in my time, but it was completely wrong and has to be condemned uh, in, in the strongest possible way. So he does, of course, have my support. And can I, can I also say that... Um, you know, firstly, to put on record, as I did at the executive meeting, that the abusive commentary that Robin received and his family received was disgusting and uncalled for, and rightly so that the PSNI are involved in, in, in dealing with that. No minister going about their job deserves to have that kind of uh, attack towards them. So um, I've said to Robin directly that, that I um, wholeheartedly condemn that attack. Um, we are committed to working together. We have unity of purpose in terms of trying to save lives. That's the executive number one priority. This is not about individuals, never has been. 
This is about the issues. This is about difference in emphasis. We are a five-party executive. We are going to have differences in terms of approaches. Um, I've always been on record as saying we need to do more testing, we need to do more in terms of PPE, that the reality was not what was experienced on the ground, was not what was being expressed. So I'll call those things out, but that does not mean we can't work together. I will continue to work with Robin through this crisis because I tell you, we all need each other more than anything now because we need to work our way through this in the best possible way that we can to support people. Number one priority, the only priority, is saving lives. That's all of our focus, that's all of our effort, and that's why I've said that I have confidence in the fact that all of our ministers are working together to bring us to the, to, through this crisis, um, because we, we will come through this, and then we're going to have a lot of work to do to build a society again, a lot of families left without their loved ones, and we're going to have a lot of building to do, and we're going to have to work together through this and on the other side of this. Can I firstly thank the First and Deputy First Minister for all that they're doing at this difficult time. It is much appreciated. <clears throat> How would the First and Deputy First Minister say that the public are responding to the requirements for social distancing? And would you be content with the response? Well, first of all, can, can I say to the member, and this is something maybe the Deputy First Minister doesn't know, I, I, I know that your daughter has recently been called up um, to become a nurse. She's in her final year nursing and she's early going in to take up her place and we want to remember her and all of her colleagues as they go into frontline nursing uh, at this time and, and please take our best wishes to her. And in terms of social distancing, as I've said, I think initially um, the social distancing message was taken. Uh, indeed, I, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say I received messages from people who were complaining that so-and-so wasn't social distancing and what was it we could do to make sure that that happened. Um, and there was quite a bit of that. But I, I do register a little concern that I think there may have been a slipping back of that uh, because as time goes on, People think, oh, well, we're, we're coming through this, we're, we're going through it. Please, please, the appeal I make today is that people continue to social distance, that they continue to stay at home, um, because it is so important that we get through this wave of, of this terrible disease and that we protect as many people as we can in the National Health Service and also to push down that peak of deaths because that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that we have the lowest number of deaths that we possibly can. I'll give a last can caller and uh, I want to thank the, the ministers for, for their statement and he's made reference to the number of tests that have been done and we know the PHA surveillance report shows that less than 10,000 people have been tested and there is the SSA arena mentioned in Citric and Derry where carers who are in residential care homes who are symptomatic or have been able to get tested there but unfortunately the vulnerable residents in those homes who are symptomatic have not yet been tested and therefore I would like to ask the ministers if they agree as a policy that we need community testing done in order to ensure that there's contact tracing uh, to detect who has COVID-19 so that we can trace who has it and then isolate uh, in order to flatten the peak and to, to stop the spread and to enable frontline workers who want to return but who are isolated and maybe don't know that they have got COVID-19 or not to return to work. So test, trace and isolate, as you mentioned, but I think we need it as a policy and community testing and people are crying out for it, as you would know yourself, uh, across the North, people are demanding that, that we take that forward. Um, yes, I mean, that, that, that is uh, my position and I think it's certainly um, in terms of the, the work that's been done on ramping up testing and rapidly um, scaling up testing, it talks about uh, moving towards that position and that's where we need to be. Um, we also have, when you look again at examples around the world of how this has been done successfully, we have um, so many people out there that want to play their part from all the sporting codes who say, what can we do, can we help, is there anything we can do? Um, with so many offers of people, if we're going to be dealing with this, which we will be for um, probably the next year, um, 
then I think that it's important that you know, the next two weeks the focus is completely about the surge and how we actually respond right now. But we have to get to the point where we're doing the full testing which is, and, and isolating and, and tracing because it's going to take us that considerable period of time to come out the other side of this. I think care homes are an, an area of particular concern. And again, when you look to examples, and there's been some tragic examples around the world of actually care homes and clusters and what that has meant and, and like large numbers of, of older people um, dying. We need to send out a cl clear message to, to society that we value everybody in society and that uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we protect all those people, uh, including those in nursing homes who need our help now more than ever. And can I also just put on record, I've heard stories of a number of nursing homes where the staff have actually moved in to actually protect the patients. And I just think that is just such an heroic um, effort and a contribution to society just second to none. The fact, the fact that people are, are so good as to, as to do that. And, um, but we have to get the, the testing out onto the ground. Uh, maximum number of people tested, the isolation, isolating and the tracing done as a matter of priority. Because we've talked about our elderly people and it is so important to say how valuable they are to our society. But Recently, I've been contacted by people who are concerned about the do not resuscitate issue, and they feel pressurized into their family signing that. I have to say that that is wrong. That is wrong and should not be happening. And uh, I note that some of the elderly charities have raised this as an issue. And it's certainly not something that our executive would condone at all. And uh, if there are circumstances where this is happening, I think we should hear about it because this is not the sort of thing that we would condone. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, can I ask the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, uh, this question? Um, I, as you will know, sadly, the, the need for an abortion is often itself an emergency for a woman, and that need does not stop in a pandemic, but the means of travelling to access abortion care in GB have disappeared, and that has been well uh, documented. Can I ask you, therefore, what is the executive doing as part of its COVID-19 response to address this health care deficit? You know, there is not unanimity at the executive in terms uh, of abortion, um, uh, and nor will there be, I think, for quite some time, if even ever. Um, and therefore, a paper uh, is coming, has come from the Department of Health. There have been some issues raised in relation to that by the Attorney General. Uh, those issues have to be looked at before we can come to a determination in relation to the issue. And just to say that um, this is about compassionate care. This is about helping women who find themselves in very difficult circumstances. This is about the executive delivering on a commitment that's already been made. The Westminster has made the regulations. The, this is the law. It must be implemented. So. Uh, I look forward to further um, conversation at the executive about how this is going to be put in place. But as we stand here today, women are being failed in this crisis. Gary Milgood, pre last Karen Corlea, and can I thank uh, the Joint First Ministers for coming before us today and, and making the statement and for all the work that they and their executive colleagues are doing to see us through this crisis. Uh, I mean, early on in the crisis, we saw panic buying, and as my own family's designated shopper, uh, uh, you know, I've witnessed myself sometimes when I'm shopping uh, late in the evening. Some of the shelves uh, maybe aren't stocked as as full as they, they should be. Can I maybe ask uh, the ministers to explain what the executive are doing to ensure that uh, you know our shelves are full and that that the supply chain keeps flowing and our so supermarkets are full? Okay, thank you. And um, I note that uh, numerous people are growing beards in this pandemic, just to note your own. <laughs> um, I, in terms of panic buying, we've been very clear to, from the very outset to say to people, please don't panic buy because you're actually leaving other people at a disadvantage um, whenever you do that. Starting work's been done in terms of trying to secure the supply chains, making sure that everything's running um, across. So we're working with retail, with the, the hauliers, with everybody else to make sure that those supply chains are in place. We're working with the ports, um, the ferry operators, everybody just to make sure that we keep those um, food supply chains going. Um, I, I'm confident that you know, whilst you might not always have the same choices you always have, but you'll certainly have a supply of food. Um, so people shouldn't be panicking. And not everybody can, 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 can go in and bulk buy. Some people live you know, week by week and their income um, dictates that. So that means it's really challenging. And 
very worrying for people. Actually, you're dealing with the crisis in itself, but then if you're panicking that you can't get your children the food that, the, that, that they eat, for example. So um, please um, encourage the public again just to say that supply chains are continually reviewed. We're, we're constantly uh, working our way through that to make sure we have adequate supply. We're not going to have shortage of food. Just choice, perhaps, is sometimes limited, but that's, that's all right. We're in a crisis. It's not normal times. I call Mr Pat Catney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, I also would like to pass on my condolences to all of those families that have lost loved ones. Uh, we know here in Northern Ireland and in Ireland the importance of awake and how, how that can bring great comfort to the families. Um, may I just also say on a back note that we as an assembly, I'm sure in the future, will find an appropriate way of coming together so that we can help those families through that grieving process. And that's something that we all could reflect on in the, fu on the future. May I also put on record of thanking uh, the, the, the Minister and the Deputy First Minister and all of our executive and uh, during this time of crisis to give my support for whatever what they can do and whatever way I possibly can and from all those that send those wishes from Lagan Valley. Given the World Health Organization crisis in COVID-19, uh, can you be caught from showing only it can be caught from showing only mild symptoms and I'm sure that both of you would agree with me, and it's more an acknowledgement than anything else, that the domiciliary care workers and the porters and the other hospital staff uh, uh, and care workers maintain the recommended safe distances required under such circumstances, and therefore the current guidance of PPE exposes these critical workers who travel from one vulnerable person to another and the risk of infection. Thank you, um, uh, Pat, and, and can I just say to you, uh, it is typical of you that you would seek to comfort people um, at a time when they're um, uh, losing loved ones, and it is a very difficult time for people. We all know that we go to neighbours' houses, friends' houses, families' houses, whenever they lose a loved one. At the moment, people are dying alone, never mind having the wake for comfort for the family. So it is a, a hugely difficult time for everyone. Um, the grieving process has been very badly interrupted and uh, I think we will have to deal with all of that in the future uh, as to how we help people to get through all of that. And just for information, the Deputy First Minister and I have been talking to mental health professionals about what happens after, um, how can we support people because for uh, many people there will be mental health issues, uh, not least for our frontline staff, who will have to see things that they probably would never want to see. So how do we deal with that? I think it was Mr Newton in this chamber who talked about perhaps post-traumatic stress disorder for a lot of our frontline workers. So how are we going to assist them? So we have already started to look at that issue uh, in the executive, and I just wanted to to make sure that people were aware of that. Obviously, we do, in terms of your question, want people to respect the social distancing rule to make sure that they are aware of the PPE guidelines. There are new guidelines out uh, across the United Kingdom. Uh, they have been uh, confirmed by the World Health Organization um, in terms of what the way in which PPE should be distributed and worn. So I hope that that new guidance will again go to reassure people, regardless of what level of PPE they require. Mr. John uh, Dowd. Last can call you. And in, in relation to the previous comments from the member, it is worth noting that everyone who dies alone as a result of this virus will have caught the virus of another person. And you do not want to be the person who passes that on, either directly or indirectly. And that is why the messaging which has been coming from OFM, DFM and the Joint First Ministers is so important. People need to isolate, they need to respect social distancing, and as has been said time and time again in the Chamber today, this weekend coming is not a bank holiday anymore, it is about saving people's lives. But to ask um, the First Deputy First Minister, um, quite rightly, the, the Executive's first priority is saving lives, but they have also, in tandem with that, uh, established a strategic forum of business, retail and trade unions about how they work together to protect workers, protect businesses, and also protect uh, the future of, of the business sector. Could they update us on how that forum is working? 
Yeah. Um, well, so, that, so the forum is met now on a number of occasions. It meets again tomorrow, and obviously it's crucially important that you bring together all the various elements. So it's um, representatives of, of each of the, the business organisations, the trade union movement, um, and the Labour Relations Agency. Um, they are the, the chief executives forum, health and safety executives. So it's a public health agency. So it's all the relevant people working together, and the forum. Um, is, is, is going to meet again tomorrow, but some of the things that they're working on is um, the essential workers uh, list. What are the who are the essential workers? Because I think that uh, clarity is um, vitally important. And then the other area that they're working on is around safety in the workplace. So anyone that has to be in work, there's going to be um, some guidance brought forward um, on that. So we expect that over the course of the next number of days, that, um, that there'll be uh, a body of work brought forward, probably under the, the economy minister, just to give more clarity around that. But it's certainly been focused around this whole area of who is the essential worker, and then the essential worker, how they're protected in their, in their workplace. The principal deputy speaker. Um, and first, I want to take this opportunity actually to congratulate Gronje Close and Shannon Sickles, and also Christopher and Henry Flanagan Cain, the first two same sex couples in the UK to enter into a civil partnership because it was their bravery and tenacity in fighting through a judicial review at great personal expense to overturn our ban on same sex marriage led to their ruling this morning in their favour from our courts, where we're yet again being told that personal and religious beliefs are no grounds for discrimination. The member is out of order, and I'm going to ask the member to resume her seat. I'm asking the member to resume her seat. So I'm it going is, to ask it, a question is, now, Mr. Could you Speaker, please. Please resume your seat for just one second. At the start, I said that questions should be related to the statement made by the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. There will be other occasions, I'm sure, where these issues can be discussed in the House. Could you please direct your comments to the statement by the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister? Thank you, Principal Speaker. Apologies. But this House also knows that the law on abortion has also changed, and I note the, the comments and questions from our colleague um, earlier as well. Um, but given that it was the Attorney General who led the legal team who lost that case that I just referred to, can I ask the ministers if they can give us any reassurance that they'll be seeking wider legal opinion immediately, um, given that the Attorney General on several occasions, on many occasions, has stated his own personal opposition to women being allowed to access abortion in Northern Ireland? Uh, one moment, one moment First Minister. Given that no part of either of those questions related to the content of the statement given by the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister, you are under no obligation to respond. If you wish to, you may. I, I hope the member is not calling into question the advice which the Attorney General is giving to the Executive in his capacity as legal adviser to the Executive, because of course that would be a very, very uh, serious charge for a member of this House to make. The Attorney General has a role to play and he has sent in serious concerns. And can I say to the member, I'm standing here today trying to save lives. That's what I'm focused on, saving lives. And I hope that everybody else is as well. Can I, can I say to the member that we need to uh, have a society that's compassionate, that provides compassionate health care to everybody, including women who find themselves in uh, very difficult circumstances. Uh, legislation has been brought forward in Westminster um, because this assembly did not uh, deliver in terms of the legislation that was required. Uh, the health minister now has an obligation to put that into place and I am quite sure that there are a number of um, representative groups out there that would legally challenge um, if, if the department does not do uh, what it needs to do in terms of bringing those, legislation, uh, those regulations into place. wholeheartedly endorse what the First Minister said in terms of best wishes to our Prime Minister uh, at this uh, critical time in terms of his personal health, and we trust he will be returned to full health and strength. Could I also endorse what you just said about uh, how critical it is at this time to be saving lives, not facilitating the termination of life, uh, and I think that needs to be said. Um, the First Minister, I suspect, will have observed, and certainly it hasn't been lost on me, and I'm sure not lost on any thinking citizen of Northern Ireland, how beneficial it has been to be able to draw down 
and be part of the largesse of the United Kingdom at this critical time, uh, and how it is good to be part of a nation with deep pockets such as the United Kingdom has. Could I say to the First Minister, I do not doubt for one moment that she is striving to do her absolute best at this critical time. It is a matter of regret. I suspect to her, who shall not say it, but certainly to me, that at the same time, necessary actions have been undermined by her partner in government, Sinn Féin, who seem more interested in grandstanding than in governing, who are more interested in carping than in delivering, and who never cease to seek to take political advantage of any crisis and get to the point of calling out the Health Minister. Those who think it's appropriate within government to call out the Health Minister, maybe they should think differently and get out, because opposition the is where you call out, not within government. Could I ask... Get to the question, please. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yeah, I've had to wait a long time, so it's coming. Uh, Mr Chairman, could I ask on that theme of dysfunctionality within the executive a question pertaining to the many companies in Northern Ireland who are still in the dark about their entitlement to be open. Companies that can safe distance. Has the executive yet got advice for them which is agreed as to whether or not such companies can be open? We've had the vilification of Ulster Carpets from the Deputy First Minister. Can we have the united guidance as to whether such companies are entitled to be open? I know we have this forum, but I know that's a talking shop. It's been talking for I 10 days. Mr. Alistair, Is there a resolution the member on this issue? Seat. It's the sort of thing that people need an answer on. This is twice I'm starting to regret making sure the smaller parties get in all the time. If we could, I think they got your question. I'll call the First Minister. Yes, so uh, in terms of the regulations that were uh, put out, um, if I can say to the member, there are those businesses um, that are closed, um, retail businesses, businesses like that. He will have seen them listed in the regulations. Uh, there are those businesses that are, of course, uh, essential because they're in the perhaps supply chain to health uh, or in the food supply. Uh, those are essential. But then there are those, and he has mentioned those, uh, Businesses that are still able to function and have an order book and are keeping people employed, for those people, those people must ensure that there is a safe working environment and that people are socially distanced and that if they can't socially distance that they are staggering the number of people on the floor or they are making sure that the canteens are used in a way that makes sure that there's not a, a number of people in the There are a number of things that can be gone through and I think the Health and Safety Executive have very helpfully put out a press release to that effect uh, two Fridays ago. So there are companies that can continue as long as they make sure that they are looking after the safety of their workers, because I think he would agree with me that that is paramount at this particular point in time. Yeah. I say to the member that the only advantage I seek is the advantage of the healthcare workers who need PPE and who need testing. Um, and I've also said that uh, the executive's number one priority is about saving lives. Shine, that's it. It's about saving lives. That's what we're trying to do here. So I think that uh, the member would, should remind himself of that on a continual basis. Call Mr Jerry Carroll. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. I want to ask the First Minister. She says that 5.5 million items of PPE has been secured. I want to ask how long that's expected to last for. Uh, and since she said that the Minister of Finance is to pursue all feasible supply routes, both international and local, uh, can she shed some light on why requisitioning of the production of PPE, testing kits and ventilators isn't being considered by the executive so we can guarantee that demand uh, is met. The Deputy First Minister rightly said that our top, top priority is saving lives, but when doctors have repeatedly called for an ECMO machine, which they estimate will, um, lo will lose tens of lives without, uh, why isn't the executive uh, pushing for this and why have they decided against it, against medical uh, advice? And according to her figures, 0.4 per cent of the population have been tested so far. Do you not accept that that is shockingly low? and that we have no idea of the scale of this crisis because of a lack of testing. And finally, um, 
He said that non-essential business should be closed, but every day workers are contacting me uh, to tell me their bosses are demanding business as usual. What plans does the executive have to begin shutting down these workplaces or uh, fending such employers? Well, I know the uh, member comes from a uh, different political philosophy uh, to myself, but even talk of requisitioning private companies must, of course, jar with the greater number of people in this House. We will work in partnership with our private sector companies, our private sector companies who I am incredibly proud of. When I hear the fact that Ramdox is providing testing kit for the whole of the United Kingdom, I am incredibly proud of the fact that an Antrim company is providing that right across this United Kingdom. And so, therefore, uh, I think he's wrong about that. I think that people have stepped up to the mark. They are offering their services in a very real and meaningful way, and they will continue to do so. In terms of the PPE, uh, there is varying, and I will write to the member with this information, there are varying uh, limits. Uh, of course, we've got different, uh, we've got, I think, over 300,000 FFP3 masks. Uh, it was very pleasing to see that number of masks coming in because they were really needed uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. I think the supply that we have received lasts for four weeks. Uh, in terms of the aprons, uh, they last for a longer period of time, but I'm happy to come back to the member in writing in relation to how long that needs. But I've already said on the record that we will need to replenish, and I've already said that we will look internationally and we will look locally uh, to make sure that that happens. And on the ECMO um, ventilator, I know that my party colleague Pat Sheehan and that um, Colin Gilton, who is chair of the Health Committee, has also raised this issue. Um, they have put down a question to the Health Minister. I think it's important that in this period that we try to get the right things delivered, and we are continuing to do that. It's one of the issues, actually, which we will uh, we can raise at the executive tomorrow whenever we're having this conversation with the, the minister. But people um, should be assured, members should be assured that PPE testing, ventilators, um, hand sanitizers. You name it, whatever is needed right now is what we're discussing and actually trying to bring about resolution to. Um, there has been progress made over the course of uh, recent days and over the last week, and we need to continue to see that progress uh, developed and built upon. And in terms of testing, I mean, it, it, it isn't a secret. That's what we've said. We want to see community testing. That is what is going to be successful in bringing us through this crisis. Um, and I welcome the fact that there has been progress. There is still a, a way to go in all of that. But um, my job, our job as political leaders in this crisis is actually to make sure that uh, we, we deliver on the things that we know that we need. And this is one of those things. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I wish to come back to the support for businesses. Um, the Small Business Rate Relief um, Scheme was a crude vehicle in which to support small businesses, and I think that the executive are now beginning to realise that, and I am pleased that they are pursuing options to try and support businesses such as small manufacturing. Um, another area which I, I'm sure they are aware of is in relation to those businesses, if their rental space was re-rated, that they would um, indeed be entitled to the, the, the scheme under the Small Business Rate Relief. And, and I just wondered, is there an opportunity through the land and property services where businesses who exist in properties where perhaps rents are being paid for more than one business within that premises, is there an opportunity for those businesses to get their own portion of that premises re-rated so that they would be eligible for this scheme. Um, I suppose the other um, uh, support I, I would like to refer to as well is those supports that are being administered by the UK government, and I appreciate the, the, the executive will be limited in what they can do with that. But the point that I would make is that the likelihood of those coming through, the monies coming in before three months, will unfortunately mean that businesses will have to fold because they don't have that cash flow. And I really must impress on both the First Minister and Deputy First Minister if they have any influence on the local banks and how they could try and support businesses, because right now they're not supporting them. Um, Dan Danska recently put out a statement where they said that they were removing interest rates from overdrafts for personal customers. So there is form there. Um, I, I think that's what we need to be doing for, for any sort of credit that these businesses currently have, not just the, the, the credit that they seek, because a lot of businesses are telling me that they don't want to take on more financial burden because they don't know if they're going to come out at the end of this rather than three months when we will review this again. Thank you. Uh, those are issues that I have heard before, um, and in terms of her very particular issue about 
being in a building um, and not paying rates, but asking to be paid. Yeah, that is one that I have raised specifically, and I wonder if she could write to the Economy Minister about that issue uh, to raise it again, because, uh, and indeed the Finance Minister, because of course he's in charge of, of rating and um, everything that goes with that. Um, I mean, the whole idea was that it was to go to the business, not the landlord. So I think it is critical that it goes to the business. Um, and not the landlord, and really the landlord should be passing the benefit on uh, to the business, but we all know that, that may not happen. So I think it would be useful if she, she did write to the economy minister about that. I have to say, disappointed to hear her experience of banking. Um, that's not what they're telling uh, to uh, ministers. They are saying that they want to be flexible and they want to work with customers and what have you. But look, sometimes the experience does not exactly fit. Um, so again, if she has a specific in instance, it would be helpful if she wrote to the economy minister on that as well. Okay, uh, that concludes questions on the statement. Uh, we shall now have a brief suspension for five minutes to allow for a change of ministers and a change of members. This meeting will resume in five minutes. Thank you. Assembly plenary, programme signed. The Speaker received notification on 6th of April that the Minister wished to make a this statement the to the Ad Hoc Assembly Committee plenary at today's meeting. Program. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends uh, to make is included at your table packet, page 3. I'd like to welcome the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to this meeting of the committee. I would also like to welcome uh, Mr Norman Fulton, an official from the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, who is accompanying the Minister today. I invite them both to make their statements from the lecterns, and the Minister should be heard, as is a ministerial statement, without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. I call the Minister. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Principal Dep Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to provide members with an update on the arrangements that are being made within the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. As we support the people of Northern Ireland in these challenging and worrying times, the coronavirus pandemic is one of the most significant challenges many of us have experienced in our lifetime not only in terms of the impact on the health of our people, but also because we face unprecedented economic and societal changes and challenges. If there is one message that I want to reinforce, is that we are all in this together, working on the basis of the most up-to-date advice from the UK Government, our medical professionals and our scientists. And if we have one lesson to learn from this, it is that working together is not an option, it's a requirement. So when we face a crisis of this scale, it reminds us of our humanity, our frailty. It reminds us of the generosity of people who sacrifice everything for their friends, for their colleagues, and even for people they have never met. And we owe everything to those people and the hundreds of thousands of pharaohs who work tirelessly to put food on our tables, to ensure we have clean water, to manage our waste, to improve our public health. We owe it to them to plan, to deliver, and to learn together. And I can reassure you that it is the aim of myself and my colleagues in the Northern Ireland Executive. We may not agree on every issue, but we all need to agree to support our frontline workers. I'd like in particular to pay tribute to our farming community, who are working day and night on their dairy, beef, pig, poultry, sheep and arable farms producing high-quality produce that ends up on our plates. They are dedicated, hard-working and resilient, and their contribution to the food chain has never been clearer. They too face the same worries and fears as the rest of us, and have adjusted how they work to keep food moving during these extremely challenging times. You have our thanks and full support. As a department, we in DARE are committed to ensuring that every effort is made to mitigate the impacts of this pandemic. Our priorities are to keep product moving, ensuring financial support to farmers, protect the health and well-being of our staff, customers and the general public, and to ensure that our essential services are carried out safely to help everyone through this difficult time. DARE, its agencies, and non-departmental public bodies continue to work through this challenging period 
We support those who provide our food, who remove our waste, and who support our rural communities. We are refining our emergency response plans and building resilience both during the crisis and for the aftermath of the pandemic as we navigate our way through a very different world. Despite all the challenges, we have provided this support in real time and in real collaboration with our stakeholders. For example, we have been tele teleconferencing with colleagues across industry two or three times a week since the beginning of this crisis, and now meet with local government colleagues twice a week. I have also attended regular, regular emergency planning meetings of the UK Government and have been in regular communication with other environment and agriculture ministers across the United Kingdom and in the Republic of Ireland. In particular, I have had several constructive conversations with the UK Secretary of State for DEFRA. We have always worked in an agile way, with more than 3,000 people located across 70 sites at the end of 2019. We made some 1,500 video conferencing calls, saving expenses and carbon. But we have taken that to a new level in this pandemic, as we continue to find new and pragmatic ways of working and change how we interact with the public. Our priority is the safety of the people who work for the department, who work alongside the department, and who rely on the work of the department. In so doing, we have had an opportunity to try out new technologies. We have learned a lot about how people can organise themselves rapidly using these technologies. And for the future, we will use these agile approaches to provide new and better services. At this point, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the DERA staff for their efforts in this challenging time, commend them on their hard work and determination, and I am proud of the part that my department has played to date in working with others. For example, the technical capacity and expertise of the Agri Food and Bioscience Institute is being used to scale up Northern Ireland's COVID-19 testing program. AFPE, which is one of my department's NDPBs, together with the Queen's and Ulster Universities, will undertake testing at its laboratories. And the program of testing, which is scheduled to commence <coughs> soon for an initial period of 12 weeks, has the capacity for 1,000 tests per day to be conducted. Until a few weeks ago, Social distancing was a term not widely used, but it is now. In our sphere of influence, the challenges range from, range from food processing to fishing vessels, from poultry to pork, from water quality to waste collection. So I am pleased that officials have been working closely with industry, the Food Standards Agency, the Health and Safety Executive, and other public sector agencies to find ways <coughs> to make it work for everyone, employees, customers and employers. And we can and will continue to protect our people by ensuring that they follow public health guidance. Maintaining our food supply is central to everyone's well-being. We feed up to 10 million people through our local agri-food industry. So protecting this food supply is, the chain is vital. And DERA is firmly focused on doing everything it can to protect this integrity and allow produce to move off farm and through it. We have prioritised essential services and staff to ensure the continued flow of food and feed. Veterinary teams are continuing to deliver essential food safety, official controls, providing veterinary certif certification for the export of both meat and dairy products. And I am particularly glad or grateful to the dairy industry, working closely with our officials as we streamline our service provision. We have communicated to local companies and to Dairy UK to ensure all stakeholders are aware of revised processes. And while essential controls will continue, I have taken steps to pause meat ins most inspections, both on farm and off farm. I have also decided that in general bovine tuberculosis testing should not take place. And this is to protect the health of farm families and the testing veterinarians. Exceptionally, visits to carry out TB tests and some inspections may take place if they can be done safely in accordance with the social distance and advice of the Public Health Agency. We continue to prioritise the prevention and detection of epizootic diseases through surveillance and testing at ports, airports, on-farm and in meat plants. Routine bovine brucellosis sampling has been paused on farms and laboratories. However, high-risk risk sampling will continue. We owe an immense debt of gratitude to everyone involved 
in our food supply chain. Food is being produced day in, day out, but cancelled orders due to the loss of food service and the hospitality sectors, significantly higher levels of consumer demand and fears about staff shortages have put unprecedented pressure on primary producers and processors. So we need to ensure that people are paid fairly for producing high quality local produce. That means supermarkets doing their bit, continuing to buy and sell excellent local produce produced by our farmers and primary producers. Commodity prices are extremely fragile, and we are already witnessing a softening in the market. As this continues, as I am sure it will, the UK government will need to step up and provide the necessary support. I am therefore monitoring the situation closely to see what needs to be done and how it can be done, and importantly, working with UK ministerial colleagues. I have been meeting with the main local banks to ensure that they are doing all they can to assist farmers who are experiencing severe cash flow problems. It is vital that the banks step up to the plate at this time. I have also chaired meetings of the main dairy processors to help establish how our critical dairy sector can navigate through this crisis. As part of my ongoing engagement with the agri-food sector, I will be meeting again with the red meat sector later this week. As I have highlighted, markets are extremely fragile. We are already experiencing a significant fall in markets. And given this uncertainty, I have been proactive in the last 10 days. I have had regular discussions with ministers across the UK and indeed with Minister Creed in the Republic. These issues are not particular to Northern Ireland. UK or the EU, but globally. Hence the need to realise the significance of the support which will be required. We have never witnessed a crisis like this before. There are many reasons for a global de decline in prices. One of the primary reasons has been the near collapse of the food service sector. And while some of the supply has been redirected to retail with an uplift in sales, unfortunately it has not been like for like. This is putting significant pressure on sales and reorientation of the types of products being sold. For example, retail has seen an unprecedented demand for wins, but not for steak, which would be a key product in restaurants. The high volumes of some products available in markets are also having an impact on prices. Export markets are also extremely sluggish, which is a key area for Northern Ireland produce, especially in sectors like lamb and dairy product sales. In relation to the lamb sector, I am fully aware of the issues which are coming down the track when large numbers of spring lamb will be available on the market. This is something which I will be monitoring extremely closely going forward. And issues about carcass imbalance are impacting on the red meat sector and lack of demand for fifth quarter products. The horticulture sector is facing significant difficulties already, and I have asked officials to scope what support we can give um, going forward. Our priority is to keep product moving off farms, and where we can't ensure that, <clears throat> to develop contingency plans and provide appropriate support to those farmers. In a meeting yesterday with retailers across the UK, I impressed the need for support to local farmers in their purchasing. I also received a commitment that they would put in place promotions to help address issues about carcass imbalance, especially for the red meat sector. There are particularly difficult market conditions facing the fishing industry. With the collapse in fish sales in the Far East, mainland Europe, and more recently domestic markets, <coughs> government initiatives such as the job retention scheme and assistance for the self employed will help the fish processing sector and ancillary fish businesses to keep their workers and put them in a better position to respond when markets for fish recover. My department has been closely engaging with the fishing representatives. And the one and a half million pound support package, which I announced last week, is aimed at helping the sea fish catching sector weather the storm. The scheme is the most far-reaching in the UK, and will help the fishing fleet to cover the fixed costs for three months. It's not an answer to everyone's problems, but it'll certainly help the fleet survive, which has been one, through one of the most difficult periods. My department is also urgently gathering evidence from the aquaculture sector on the impact of COVID-19. A report on this is expected shortly, and the Department will make a decision on what measures may be needed in relation to support once it has been fully considered this data. 
The decision taken by the Northern Ireland Livestock March to close for two weeks is a helpful intervention, and DERA is working with the markets to ensure livestock movements can continue to be facilitated through a combination of APHIS Online and Telephony services. Markets are currently working to establish protocols which would allow a restricted opening in the near future. However, I must caution that only through sensible action will we deliver sustainable solutions. We are focused on keeping daily movements of food, feed and produce moving into and out of Northern Ireland. And in that context, some of the ferry companies have recently highlighted significant operational difficulties. This is deeply concerning. And my department is working with other departments, led by the Department for Infrastructure, to address this issue. Haulage and logistic companies are facing immense difficulties, such as the lack of return loads, loss of large volumes of business, and significant overheads. Farmers are vital to the people in the country, and it is imperative that they also follow the public health agency advice and take all appropriate steps to look after their health. Farming unions are rightly concerned about their members and the implications which falling ill with COVID-19 would have for them, the welfare of their livestock and their ability to keep the business running. In conjunction with the Farmers' Union, I have issued advice to farmers on how to deal with possible infection by COVID-19, and my department will continue to work with them and other departments to explore options to mitigate the possible impacts and safeguard animal welfare. For this reason, I have stopped all face-to-face -face services at DERA direct offices for the time being. Customers should conduct their business through DERA online services, which is available 24 hours per day by telephone or by post. The online single application and entitlement service is operating as normal. An enhanced single application form advisory service is available to provide farmers with advice and digital assistance to help them complete and submit their SAF. The closing date for SAF remains unchanged. However, I have extended the deadline by which farmers can amend their applications from the 31st of May to the 9th of June. Farmers are encouraged to submit their applications as soon as possible and ahead of the closing date of the 15th of May. And in this way, we can ensure that our farmers receive accurate payments in October. Face-to-face -face delivery of all CAFRI programmes has also ceased. Education programmes are being delivered remotely to ensure that the academic year is completed and students achieve their qualifications. Although CAFRI Open Days have also been postponed, those interested in applying for CAFRI courses should apply online as normal. Delivery of existing outstanding projects under the Farm Business Improvement Scheme is continuing as far as practically possible. Processing of applications to Tranche 5 of the Business Development Group Scheme and registration of the farmer growers are continuing remotely. CAFRI advisors are also available to assist farmers and food businesses with technical business and environmental advice to support them in this challenging time. Arrangements are being progressed to facilitate the use of CAFRI's residential facilities at Greenmount and Enniskillen campuses by the Department of Health as part of their contingency planning. CAFRI has also made available over 20,000 overalls and other personal protective um, equipment to the Health and Social Care Trust. And despite public health agency and government advice on social distancing, DERA's country parks and forest parks saw large numbers of the public continue to gather and visit sites in increased numbers, with many ignoring the advice given. Therefore, at the end of last month, I shut down vehicle access as far as possible to those forests and country parks and public fishing waters. I am disappointed that I had to take that decision, particularly at a time when children are out of school and others were using the facilities for physical and mental health reasons. However, I felt they had no alternative and did so to help save lives. And these arrangements will be kept under review. This Easter, I would implore people to think safety, think about your friends, family and neighbours, and think about our health and care workers. Take your exercise locally and do not congregate in country and forest parks, beaches or other open spaces. There is an increased risk of social isolation for rural communities, which may be heightened due to restricted access to much-needed services. And my department is collaborating with colleagues in the Department for Communities, the Public Health Agency and local government to support a coordinated approach to assist the community and voluntary sector in this time of crisis. Dear officials have been assisting colleagues in DFC who are leading in the provision of food for vulnerable people. 
including delivery to the Shielded Group, which will be coordinated through local councils and starts on Wednesday the 8th of April, as well as the work underway to assist other vulnerable groups in society. We have provided all community and voluntary sector funded partners with the much needed flexibility to focus our resources in responding to the current challenge. The rural support networks support a network of over 1,500 rural community and voluntary sector organisations and are already involved in a number of initiatives such as engagement with food banks, drawing up lists of these groups who can offer help and seeking to identify people who will need help. We expect them to be at the forefront as part of DERA's response. Councils and other departments are also making use of their local knowledge. It is anticipated that they will play an important role in delivering measures under the Executive Community Fund and ensuring penetration to rural areas. We are working with DFI and DFC to ensure that the DARIS Assisted Rural Travel Scheme can be utilised <coughs> to assist the delivery of much needed food and services to isolated rural dwellers, and with our health partners to ensure vulnerable rural households are contacted on a regular basis and their needs met. The Rural Support Charity stands ready to help those rural individuals in stress and will support them with whatever is needed in these challenging times. We have also provided emergency guidance and the ongoing support to administrative partners delivering leader and TRIPSI programmes. This includes easements to support payment to project applicants and the reallocation of DERA resource to process almost £2 million in payments to micro-business and community organisations in the last three weeks. This money has never been more important in supporting the survival of organisations, staff and their families, and the communities they support. DERA is continuing to work with Northern Ireland Water, prioritising activities to help ensure that we continue to have access to safe drinking water. Essential staff continue to analyse water samples from key drinking water supplies. Responding to reports of water pollution remains a priority in order to help protect raw water supplies. The Drinking Water Inspectorate, DWI, has been working closely with NI Water local councils and owners and users of private water supplies to ensure all necessary measures are in place to protect the public health. A task and finish group with membership from across the Northern Ireland Environment Agency has been, identified, been established to identify issues which might arise due to an increase in burials. The group will provide, adv produce advice and guidance on how best to mitigate against these. The links into the DOJ pandemic uh, working group. It is important to recognise that waste workers are one of our essential services, covering all those involved in managing waste, whether collection, transportation, treatment or disposal. DEAR's priority is to maintain the fullest range of council waste services as possible, um, including recycling, which supplies the waste industry and contributes contributes to the packaging sector. Recycling material from much of the commercial sector is no longer available. At present, all 11 councils are maintaining curbside collections, though the, though, though the majority of councils' household waste recycling centres are closed. DERA has established a COVID-19 waste group, and regular meetings are taking place with local councils and the private waste sector to capture their concerns and discuss contingency plans. The Strategic Investment Board is involved in attempting to match up capacity and resource pressures across the sector, and we are working with delivery partners in key messaging, and the Waste Industry Safety and Health Forum has issued guidance to maintain services and observe social distancing. A range of COVID-19 regulatory position statements has been prepared by NIEA to ensure pragmatism and flexibility in the waste sector, for example, on authorised waste facilities and temporary variation of licence permit conditions, with the reduction in legitimate waste services and increased waste arising, there is more risk of illegal dumping and fly tipping. I would urge people not to indulge in irresponsible behaviour, which can have such a damaging effect on public health, and the Department is working closely with local councils on this matter. All our advice is kept under review and, where necessary, updated. This is to ensure public health is protected and risk to drinking water quality and waste services are minimised. Finally, the reduction in single-use carrier bags is hugely important, but there is a need to show flexibility in these unprecedented times. Carrier bags for home deliveries reduce the need for drivers to enter houses. The use of these bags also speeds up home deliveries. 
my department has therefore made the single-use carrier bags charge coronavirus amendment regulations in Northern Ireland 2020, which have the effect of meaning that for six months the requirement to charge for a carrier bag does not apply to bags used for home delivery as part of a grocery delivery service. The regulations come into operation on 1 April 2020. In conclusion, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, in closing, it is worth um, again reflecting uh, <clears throat> on the huge efforts underway to mitigate the impacts of this pandemic. Today, I am calling on the public to support those efforts, to follow PHA advice and to take all of the necessary precautions to mitigate against the worst effects. We have had to deliver at pace, take rapid decisions and act quickly to protect our people, our economy and our environment. Not all of these decisions will be perfect. We will need to acknowledge that now, but they have been made with the best intentions and a strong desire to play our part in meeting the challenges we are all facing. We will continue to review and adapt our actions in line with government advice as more information becomes available. This crisis has brought the interconnectedness of our economy, environment and people into sharp focus. DARE will continue to play its full part in the Northern Ireland response effort to COVID-19, supporting our people and business and leading them through these difficult times. Through continued cooperation and collaboration and by supporting each other, we will get through this. And while it is critical that we focus on the here and now, it is also important that we look ahead to the future with optimism and plan for recovery. I know that the Northern Ireland Executive my department will have an important role to play, and we have already started to develop proposals to support the recovery of our economy, environment and people. These proposals will focus on the traditional values of hard work, thrift, using our resources to their best effect, and self-reliance value in our local environment and economy. And I look forward to sharing these propo proposals with people over the coming months. Thank you, and can I ask that each of you and your families take care of yourselves, your neighbours and each other. Thank you, Minister. I thank the Minister for making his statement. I will now invite members to ask the Minister questions. Again, I will allow a period of around one hour for this. It is my intention to allow all members who wish to ask a question to so do. However, this does depend on members asking focused and succinct questions that are relevant to the statement that we have just heard. Please note that because this is a committee meeting and not a plenary session of the House, it is in order for the Minister to ask Mr Fulton to respond to questions where he considers it appropriate. I call Mr Declan McAleer. Uh, and I thank the Minister for his statement. And I just uh, noted one of the headlines in one of the farm papers the weekend is that not all heroes wear capes, some of them drive tractors. And I think that's uh, very, very true at the moment if we look at what our farmers are doing for our community right now in the middle of this crisis. And the Minister will be acutely aware of the, um, of the importance of uh, food, uh, secure food supply in the midst of this crisis that we're in, and indeed all the time. And he also will be very acutely aware of the importance of the local march for the, the trading for the trading of livestock, and uh, I, I commend the decision by the the NA uh, local auctioneer association of taking the decision to close the market. It's a very responsible decision, where they put the uh, public health of their staff and their customers uh, f front and centre. But also, um, the minister will be aware that this causes difficulties in terms of the movement of livestock and in terms of the wider production chain, the food supply chain. And I know this department has been in contact and negotiations with the NALEA and the HSE. And I wonder could he give us his assessment about how trading could continue in a, in a non-contact way. And I note, for example, across the water in Britain, the first online uh, mart, I think, is, is taking place today. So I'm just looking for his assessment as to how uh, trading could continue in a non-contact in a very safe, socially distanced manner in the current climate. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I, I do know that Marts are looking at how they might open again um, and how they can actually tie to other uh, means of trading um, at the same time. So, w w one of the things that, that I have heard being suggested is if the Marts open again, um, it will be on the basis that the seller leaves his livestock off and leaves the Mart. Um, the Mart is restricted exclusively to buyers 
the social distancing will operate in the ring uh, where the sale would take place. And uh, then the animals would be sold conditionally for the farmer to accept the price or not accept the price uh, whenever the mart rings through. So that is a suggestion that, that has come forward. I think that the marts will probably move ahead um, and open once things scale down a bit. I don't think they're quite ready to do that yet because their assessment is that the social distancing that has been observed is making a difference and that uh, they don't want to take any risks for the public health. So I think that not just yet, um, but perhaps later in April, um, we may see the marts open again on a very restricted basis. Principal Nick, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his detailed statement to the House today, and thank the Minister also for his endeavours as he does his best to help the industry at this time. Uh, given that the UK is still in the Brexit transition stage, what support, of any, has the EU provided to the agri-food sector? Well, we, we are still <coughs> responsible um, to EU regulation up to October this year. So, in terms of how we would support um, the farming community uh, in Northern Ireland here, uh, we are still under EU regulation. And uh, therefore, I have been, um, through Minister Eustace and indeed Minister Creed, uh, been stating the case for Northern Ireland and how they can assist us uh, in ensuring that the, the appropriate measures are put in place. Now, I had a long conversation with the dairy sector and the farmers' unions last night. Uh, we had a, a meeting, um, but of course, by, 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 by <coughs> mobile communication, of course, not, not meeting together, but we had a meeting. And the indication is from, from them is the EU have an awful habit of waiting until the crisis has already happened. We can see the crisis happening in front of our eyes in terms of the, the dairy sector, for example. And we can anticipate what's happening with the lamb sector in particular, and we can see the problems in the beef sector, and we know the problems already existing in the fishing sector. So we can see all of that already, and uh, we need to be moving now. And uh, I would implore um, the European Union officials to be on the ball, recognise that there is a world crisis in terms of health, and there is a knock-on effect in terms of agriculture. And if we are to have an agricultural sector when this is over, um, if we are not to go, going to have numerous bankruptcies and people no longer able to conduct their business, then we need to respond to it and respond to it quickly. And that is what, need, what needs to happen at this stage. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to thank the Minister for his statement. And at the end of his statement, he wished the House here um, protection and safety for all their families. I also, in return, have learned that one of his own family members has been struck down. I wish her a speedy recovery, and I'm sure most of the House would agree with that and pass on uh, our best wishes to your family members, well, Minister. Um, can I also thank him for the advice he has given uh, to households to manage waste at this time? Uh, could I ask if he will be assisting the councils? Uh, to deal with increased household waste and will amend licensing laws when required or were required and look at any financial assistance where or when needed. Thank you. Thank you, Member, for his question. Thank you for his personal remarks as well. That is very much appreciated. Um, in terms of how we respond to waste, and, you, know, you really see how critical people are whenever we have a crisis like this here. We take our waste collectors for granted. You know, we were at our house this morning about half six in the morning, and away it goes. And we don't see any more for waste, and that's brilliant. But, you know, at this moment in time, if those people closed off, that creates another public health problem. So you ask about the regulations. We will provide the maximum flexibility for all of our sectors. And as we've worked through, that's what we've been doing. Nobody can accuse us of actually not being flexible at this stage. And if there are areas where we still have um, things to do, I'm very happy to, to deal with those as they are addressed to us. Financially, <coughs> I am aware of additional strains in councils. So we will work with them. Um, we will 
identify where those strains lie, how those can be best accommodated. And we will look at how, right across the board, um, we can provide the appropriate financial assistance uh, to people that are related to our department. And of course, we have to do that through the Department of Finance. But nonetheless, we need to recognise that there are a wide scale of people out there who need our support and assistance to get to the other side of COVID-19. We're all getting to the other side of this, by the way. Um, it's going to be a real challenge. Sadly, there will be those who lose their lives, and that is horrendous for all of the families involved. But the vast majority of us will get to the other side of this, and it will be a horrible memory that we have, but we will be able to move forward um, once that's done. And we need to have some confidence that that's the case, but we need to work together uh, with each other to overcome this at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker and Minister. Thank you for your statement. And can I also wish you, your family member, a speedy recovery, speedy and safe recovery? Thank you. Um, Minister, you spoke in your statement, um, you give some clarification around uh, on farm TB testing uh, this afternoon. Does this allow farmers who want to have their herds? opened following perhaps a breakdown, uh, or indeed any other reason, to have the test carried out if they can comply with social distancing? Well, the TB testing is normally carried out by private veterinary practices, and most of those private veterinary practices are actually the, the, the farmers' vets. So, uh, In that instance, um, the vet can do it if the vet wishes to do it. So the farmer needs to be able to assure the vet that that's the case. Before a test would take place, um, they would have to identify, are we capable of doing this within the public health agency's um, guidelines and recommendations? And if they're not capable of doing it, the test won't happen. If they are capable of doing it, they can do the test, but that is an agreement between the vet and the farmer. So we're not precluding that. We're saying that normally tests won't take place, but where it's very important to have heard to get reopened again, and where the private vet is happy to do it, and where social distancing can be observed, then that is permissible. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, before I ask my question, can I take a moment, Principal Deputy Speaker, to thank the Minister, of course, for this statement. Thank him also for his good wishes to those within this House, and extend to him also our good wishes um, from, from this bench to him, his, his colleagues, and his family uh, for, for the times ahead. And also, I'd like to associate myself with the uh, gratitude the Minister has expressed to the various areas of public service that, that are. Uh, providing for all of us at the moment, on, on whom we are so heavily dependent. Further, Principal Deputy Speaker, to the information contained on page 11 of the report um, in relation to uh, the delivery of food for the vulnerable, the, the Minister may already be aware that I have corresponded with DERA, Department of Health and uh, Department for Communities regarding priority access um, for online food deliveries. This, of course, relates primarily to supermarkets. Um, and is of benefit to those who can register if they are self-isolating as a result of direct advice from government, usually for a period of 12 weeks. Some local supermarkets, Principal Deputy Speaker, have indicated a willingness to take part in this scheme, which appears to require registration. It seems it is uh, led in GB by DEFRA. And my question basically boils down to, is there a chance that DERA, uh, in conjunction with other departments if necessary, can implement this scheme in Northern Ireland? Yes, I'm aware of the scheme that the member refers to, <coughs> and it seems to be operating successfully in um, Great Britain. Um, I know that supermarkets such as Asda would find it difficult to actually implement this scheme in Northern Ireland, and they need help and support to do it. Um, so whilst they're willing to do it, and they need help and support to, to do it. I understand that it falls within DFC, but if we can assist and help in any way, um, our department will be happy to do that in terms of taking the scheme that, that's, that's in GB and, and bringing it to here. Uh, in terms of, I just would add further, uh, in terms of food banks, uh, DFC have a, have, are, are going to contribute £200,000 additional to food banks. DERA is match funding that £200,000. Um, and we're going a little further in that it is being distributed through the Community Fund in Northern Ireland. The Community Fund in Northern Ireland doesn't fund religious groups. And a number of our food banks are delivered by 
um, groups, which has um, religion as, as its base. So we're putting an additional 50,000 to fund those food banks, um, which are organised by people from religious backgrounds. Thank you again, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Can I ask the Minister what discussions he has had with other devolved regions, and are they facing similar problems and difficulties similar to ourselves here in Northern Ireland? And can I also say I welcome the Minister's recently announced scheme for a fishermen? Thank you. We have been in discussion with our, our Scottish and Welsh counterparts, um, both on, on agriculture and indeed in fisheries. And Scotland were the first to move in fisheries. Uh, we took a little longer. Uh, we've done something a bit more extensive than the Scottish were offering. And uh, we are working close, clo closely with them in terms of how we can press to get um, support for the agriculture and food processing sector uh, to come out the other side. But people need to realise how critically important it is that we keep this thing going. Because we will have a health crisis and that is the first priority. And the first priority is supporting our health service, our health minister and the team around them. Um, because the burden that has been imposed upon them is just incredible. Uh, and and we, we all need to respect and reflect that. And that is our first priority. But people are at home. There is no hot food outlets virtually opened at all. No restaurants and, and all of that there. And people are dependent on the food that is in our shops um, to actually live. And we have to keep that food chain going. So last week, when there were problems in the food processing sector, and um, you know, there were some workers' walkouts and all of that there, and I respect um, the workers who had concerns about their health, and I appreciate the response that there has been in many of those places to ensure that the workers' health uh, was made considerably safer. And it is still not 100% ideal, but nonetheless, it is absolutely critical for the well-being of the people in this country that the food sector is kept going and the food processing sector is kept going. So we need to ensure that food chain exists. Um, we're having those discussions with the Scottish, with the Welsh. I've had a series of discussions with my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland because a lot of our milk goes south of the border. A lot of their pork comes north of the border, their chicken. You know, so there's, uh, we're all in this together. And it goes beyond this assembly, it goes beyond Northern Ireland, it goes beyond the UK, it goes beyond Ireland, it goes beyond these, uh, you know, these islands, it goes, you know, it's right throughout the world. We're all in this together and we can stand together or, or, or fall together and I'd much prefer that we stand together at this stage. Uh, last part, pre Ken Collier, uh, and I thank the Minister for his statement. And just following on from uh, my committee colleague who t touched on the support that the Minister announced to the fishing industry recently, can I ask the, the Minister uh, how, how this is progressing and how quickly it will uh, get to those who need it? Well, it, it involves a, a process which will actually involve the, 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 this assembly. And, uh, I think there's some degree of legislation, Norman, is that right? Yep. Yeah. So, with the best will in the world, I think the earliest that we can get payments out will be in early May, which will be ahead of some of the work that the Assembly does, but, but we'll still be allowed to get payments out um, if we can get um, things moving at, at the appropriate pace. And <clears throat> that's, that's, of course, a work that, that I will uh, engage with yourselves as quickly as possible on in terms of delivering. Uh, I should add that the aquaculture sector uh, and the freshwater fishermen um, are not included in that, but we are looking at that. So, for example, the Loch Ness eel fishermen, uh, I know that eel fishery is closed down, that in Holland they, they aren't the, the, where they were selling most of the product, that has closed down. So, we will be looking at how we can respond uh, to those areas as well. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, my question sort of follows on from a colleague here in uh, Lagan Valley. 
Minister, in your statement, you referred to your department's uh, communication with local councils and the private uh, waste companies. And obviously, the closure of waste facilities in local council has caused an issue with, with fly tipping. So, the two points are two questions: is how can you can control the overuse of uh, landfill at this time generally? And what message can you send out to those that think it's okay to fill their boots or their vans with rubbish, travel into the countryside, generally the countryside, open the door and throw it out? I think that's acceptable. On a time like this, we see the, the good in people, and we see the, ultimately the bad. So, ultimately, what can we do about overuse of landfill, and what can we do about those people who think it's okay to leave their washing machine on the side of my road? Well, it's never okay to leave your waste at the side of side of a road. Um, we've always had good mechanisms to, to dispose of that kind of waste. Um, unfortunately, that's not available at this moment in time. But even when it was available, there were still some people um, tended to use uh, the, the fly tipping way. Um, with, with the reduction, we, we see the increased risk of fly tipping. So we're working closely with the councils on the matter, and then I direct fly tipping pages being updated um, accordingly for the reporting of, of waste crime, and I'd encourage people to report it. Um, I would be prepared to work with councils in increasing um, the, the, the fines for fly tipping. If only to get a message out to people that if you're caught, you could be hit quite heavily. Um, so that is something that I'm prepared to work with uh, the councils on. DERA and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency COVID-19 Waste Management Contingency Group has been established uh, to coordinate and maintain the fullest range of waste management services possible. So there's a weekly meeting which has been established with local councils, the Government Waste Working Group, and the Strategic Waste Partnership Group. And that's also the waste industry. So there has been good uptick by people in the waste industry uh, in terms of dealing with the problems that, that exist. Uh, but it's something that we really need to keep our eye on. It's critically important that we maintain public health, and one of the means of maintaining public health is by the appropriate um, disposal of waste. And we don't want to lose sight of, of recycling and uh, not sending material to landfill where it's unnecessary to do it uh, in all of this, and that's a course of work we'll continue to, to engage in. Gorham Haggard, I pray you last can call you, <clears throat> and thank you to the Minister for those answers. Um, the Minister will know, and I suppose I should declare an interest in coming from a small a farming background myself and my own family, but um, the Minister will know that at the present time farmers are under financial difficulties given increased cost of meal and fertiliser and given that the marts are closed. So in light of the, the very welcome scheme that you discussed there a moment ago with uh, my colleague around fishing, I would like to ask the Minister, are there any plans to put in place crisis funding for farming? Well, we have written to the Department of Finance at this stage and outlined what our needs would be. Our needs we identified at over £100 million in terms of dealing with the areas in, in this department uh, which need assistance. And that is almost certainly too significant for the Northern Ireland budget to deal with and the Northern Ireland government to deal with. Therefore, we are looking to the UK government and indeed to uh, uh, Brussels at this point uh, to see what can be delivered uh, because we believe that this is not a Northern Ireland problem, this is a, a, a global problem. And therefore, we need to work within the parameters uh, that currently exist. And uh, th within those parameters, we need to deliver. Another area that I have been looking at is banking, uh, because for some people, this, is, this isn't a business problem, it's a cash flow problem. So you mentioned about not being able to sell livestock. That livestock is still there, it's still an asset, and that asset will be realised a number of weeks down the line as opposed to now, and consequently those people will, will have maybe problems um, meeting payments at the end of the month or whatever as a result of that. Uh, so <coughs> met the, uh, we met the Bank of Ireland, Danske Bank and, and Ulster Bank <coughs> excuse me, last week, and uh, a number of the banks are, are showing um, very good proactivity if they carry out what they say they're going to. So, for example, one of the banks is offering a freeze on loans. So there's no payments required over the course of the next three months on either interest or indeed um, paying down the actual loan 
it will just be pushed back to the end of the loan. So um, your loan, which may have been ready to mature in, say, October 2021, will then mature in, in January 2022. Uh, one of the other banks wa was offering to uh, have no interest repayments in that period, uh, which is all helpful. Um, so w we need to ensure that cash flow continues to take place uh, within our banking sector and that they work and are flexible with not just farmers and food processors in general, that they're, that, that they're flexible uh, with, with the business community. Uh, because at the other side of this, we need a business community. At the other side of this, we need farmers. At the other side of this, we need food processors. Uh, because we will hit another crisis if that is not the case. I expect unemployment to rise significantly as a consequence of COVID-19. It's our task to ensure that we provide as much opportunity for people to maintain and retain their business that they can pick it up after this crisis is over. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I'd echo what the Minister said about um, people who work in our, um, our food industry and people particularly who work in the waste sector as well who are like lots of people, healthcare, frontline healthcare workers and lots of other people, the true value of what they do and how they serve us is becoming more and more apparent every day when we go through this crisis, how much we depend on them, their sacrifice, their hard work, the fact that they get up early in the morning to do things for us. I'd also um, echo what he said in relation to the banking sector, but I'd say that you know, we need the banking sector to really step up here. There are too many reports, and particularly given our, our, our big four banks are dominated by banks that are either controlled by the state in Dublin or the state in London, we need them to really step up for our farmers and our businesses generally. My specific question is on, he's teased me in the past about being a member for South Belfast. There aren't too many big farms in South Belfast, but there are lots of people who rely on and buy food, and indeed I am one of them. Pleased to say in the last week I got a great delivery of local seafood from Sea Source NI, who I can give a shout out to, who are based in Kilkeel. And I think fishermen from, um, from County Down drop their catch off and it's being delivered to people's houses during the current crisis. I'm interested in, can he or the department offer any guidance to consumers out there who actually want to be part of a solution in terms of buying local? Clearly farmers and fishermen are getting their produce to supermarkets and that's great and people are going into the supermarkets buying and social, and social distancing but buying, hopefully buying responsibly. But what ways can people support local producers? Can there be a, an online portal where people go, can go and say, I want, you know, I want to be able to buy local, I want to be able to grow great local produce? How can the department help with that? Well, I, I can't speak for my own local area in this, and the, the, local, the local authority is doing excellent work in terms of providing information. And all of those local shops who are doing home deliveries, and I'm seeing all of the wee butchers and bakeries and so forth popping up, and they're offering those home, home, home deliveries, and, and it's tremendous. And, and I'm on a few community pages, and, and they're saying, you know what, I just ordered um, so much from, from such and such a, a shop, and we had it around two days later, and it was a great service, and then others are, are buying into that. And it's, I suppose in any crisis you want to see, can, can there be good things come out of it? And it really would be good if there was more support for local businesses, because when the going gets tough, those are the people who are always there. They're always, they're always there. And I think it would just be tremendous to see a revival in our local butcheries and bakeries and greengrocers and all of those kinds of shops. It's been sad to lose them over the years and see the, the, the big multiples come in and just, just take them all out. And uh, maybe we will learn to appreciate those small retailers a bit more and we'll maybe spend a pound or two more in those local shops to sustain them and keep them going as opposed to always looking for the cheapest option, and very often it isn't the cheapest option, but they're very good at marketing themselves um, from the big multinationals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just want to thank the Minister, and, and that was nicely teed up for me, uh, Mr. Mr. O'Toole, because uh, I want to talk about the small shops and the agri uh, products, but I want to commend you, Minister, for your performance, and uh, along with the executive team, um, there's no doubt I think you were cut out for this role uh, and this department and you're passionate about it and it was heard today when you spoke so passionately about the complexity of the services uh, that underpin 
uh, your department and all those that serve. Just, just one thing before I get to my question, if you'll indulge me, uh, Mr. Speaker. You talked about the, um, the refuge collectors being out at half six in the morning waking you up. Well, 20 years I'm living in the country. And the only people that beat the, 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 those people to, to waken you early is the farmer. When he gets up at half five with the three-ton roller in the back of his tractor outside your house, God bless him, uh, Will Greer. Um, Minister, um, you highlight some of the issues with regard uh, around the sale of agri products. And you, in the last uh, question, you answered it brilliantly. I'm a former butcher myself, uh, passionate about butcher shops and buying local. Would you consider recommending to put in place a minimum price guarantee on ag agri products in supermarkets to ensure a fair, retrain, a fair return for primary producers and also for those shops um, that we want to support? Because, as you rightly pointed out, there are a number of shops who are benefiting at the moment because they're able to provide that local service quickly for people. But we also know that on the other side of this, the pressure that comes on people is buying cheap. And I remember uh, as a butcher when Brazilian beef came in and we were selling Irish beef. And we couldn't compete. And you're saying these would be skinny steaks. And this, the, the date, Mr. Speaker, on these pieces of beef when they come in is four or five months. And you're saying, how on earth does that stuff last in a pre packed packet? It's, there's just something not right about it. So could you uh, uh, consider putting such a recommendation in place, Minister? Well, I suppose we have lived in a generation which has witnessed globalization. And we're now suffering, perhaps, because of globalization. And the fact that there's people travelling so much around the world has led to this virus travelling so easily around the world as well. You know, if 200 years ago, if a virus had struck in China, it probably would have just stayed in China. And that's just a reality of globalisation, that people are travelling all over the world and doing things all over the world, and consequently, everything is global. And I do think that it is a time to pause and reflect. I'm not sure how legitimately we can actually have minimum food prices. And I'm not sure that that's probably somewhere where national government wants to go. Because ultimately in the United Kingdom there's 65 million people and there's you know, a few hundred thousand farmers. And politically, and for any government, it's probably not the wisest thing to drive the food costs up to the 65 million to assist the two or three hundred thousand. But nonetheless, there is ways of, of helping and supporting the, the, the the hundreds of thousands of farmers and, and food processors, <coughs> and ensuring that the public do get good quality food. I should say that one thing that has come really to the fore about this is food security. We live in an island, and I know that there has been issues, and we're currently dealing with issues in ferries, and Minister Mallon's leading on that, doing a good job. Um, but there's issues about ferries, and we need to retain the ferry service between um, not just Northern Ireland and, and, and Great Britain, because 10% of our goods come in um, from Dublin. 100% or 98% of our oxygen comes in from Dublin. So those connections have to, have to exist. But the fragile connection that really exists is between Great Britain and, the Euro and Europe. And if there's any issues at Calais at all, there's problems caused. And if capacity at Calais goes down, Britain doesn't have enough food for itself very quickly. So the very smart people who, who work at Vaison and Number 10 and, and, and other places, and Mr. Toogood would have been one of those people, and, and, and he wouldn't have given this advice. And I know that he would have known better than to give such advice. But in the last six weeks, I heard a couple of advisors saying, we don't really need British farmers anymore, and we don't need to produce food in Britain anymore. And what stupid advice that was and how everybody in Britain, the most ordinary person uh, without any degrees or, or, or qualifications can see, we need food produced locally. It is better produced locally. It is fresher produced locally. We've got more traceability locally. So we need to support those local businesses. And perhaps it's something that we can engage with in terms of our business sector and local government after this. And how do we build up our local shops again? How do we fill our high streets with local shops again? And how do we actually take back control of our lives, maybe from the global superpowers, multinationals, and all of that there? Mr. Carl think I've had a real conversion, so I will. But, <laughs> but I do genuinely have a passion 
I do genuinely have a passion for local business. I, 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 don't, I, I don't like all of, the, all of these, the, these big guys coming in and, and dictating to us what we should be doing and how we should be living our lives. I accept the reality maybe a little more than Mr. Carl in the cases, but I do see an opportunity for us to, to, to revive that side of things again beyond this. Mr. Speaker, and uh, can I thank the Minister for what was a very comprehensive statement and I think uh, recognises the, the, the breadth of the department and also uh, the way in which the Minister is across that detail. He, he did serve uh, in multiple departments, uh, considerable experience, uh, and I know that that uh, is being of uh, great value to the wider executive as well, uh, and so we encourage him in, in the work that he's doing on that front. Uh, he's highlighted a number of, of innovative ways in which uh, he's adapting the department around the use of the laboratories for increasing testing, and that's something that the, the wider public really need to see, much more testing and the utilisation of AF, AFB to do that, I think will be very important uh, going forward. And I would like him just to elaborate on uh, any more of that uh, innovation uh, that can take place. Uh, he, he said in his statement that we're all in this together. And we've talked at length about supporting local and those local businesses that often contribute greatly to their local community in a way that not always the big multinational global corporation does, which is of more interest in paying out a dividend to its shareholders often than it is in terms of its community reach in the locality in which it operates. A number of farmers contacted me over the past week. Uh, hugely frustrated at the importation uh, of cheap beef from outside of the locality. And at a time when they are needing support, they did not feel that they were getting that from the large supermarkets. What steps has he taken uh, to deal with the supermarkets in respect of that supply chain to encourage them to support local and also to deal with uh, some of the evidence that is coming through that those large supermarkets are increasing prices on some of those core basic materials that go into people's baskets. Because I've heard that from constituents that items two weeks ago that are fundamental to the home are now becoming more expensive at a time whenever people's money in their pocket isn't going as far as it used to. Well, because of the circumstances that we exist, um, some of the competition rules for supermarkets have been slackened, um, and necessarily so. Uh, but I don't consider that to be something which should be seen as an opportunity by people to make more money. Um, retail trade was up 22% in the month of March. So, you know, everybody could see <coughs> how our, our, our supermarket shelves were, were emptying, and, and they were benefiting greatly um, from uh, the, the buying that, that people were engaging in. And there is anecdotal evidence that prices are slipping upwards. And I have to say that it is not appropriate, unless there is a particular reason that a good has to be raised in price, and that is because it is costing them considerably more and they have no choice but to pass it on. There needs to be very good reasons that the public at home are not paying more for the services and for the goods um, without there being very significant justification for it. Um, when it comes to the importation of, of beef, um, I raised this with uh, the two supermarkets involved, and I called them out on it very clearly that it wasn't acceptable. Interesting enough, they said they, they, that it wasn't going to happen again, but they said it was necessary um, the last time. Um, I don't accept that it was necessary. I don't believe that it should have happened, and we are all in this together. And at a time whenever pressures are on beef prices as things stand, where farmers' incomes over the past two years have reduced by 24 and 25 per cent, respectively. It was an entirely inappropriate thing to be importing uh, product at this time um, to um, the UK supermarkets. And I would urge them to support their own local people, to support their own local businesses. It is local people that support them. They are not getting business from all over the world. They are getting the business from the local people, so they need to support the local people back. And they need to support the local people back by buying locally, and they need to support the local people back by selling at prices which are not inflated over a period of crisis, because that is something which would be entirely inappropriate, that the consumer would have to be paying more 
um, to gross up uh, the profits of large corporations. Can call it, and I want to thank the, uh, the Minister for, for his statement. The Minister, I listened to you quite carefully when you were talking about the risk of social isolation due to restrictive access to uh, too much needed services. And I was conscious of what you said around the collaborative work that was taking place between yourself and Minister Deidre Hargy around the community, particularly around feeding the most vulnerable in our society around the food banks. It struck me listening to you, and maybe it was just not in your statement, but it would be helpful for us to understand the kind of collaborative work that's going on between yourself and the Minister of the Economy in the context of broadband. I stand here as someone, I mean, I don't live in the rural uh, community, but I have lots of friends there. But it's very difficult to, uh, to communicate. And we're saying to a population of people to stay at home. And yet, we know the difficulties that there are with broadband. And there's lots of apps now that I think to say Zoom and Discord and even house parties, you know, apps that I'd never heard of before this pandemic. But it's allowing us to communicate with our families and our friends and our loved ones. And yet, people from the rural community that don't have access to broadband are finding that most difficult. And the thousands of them that have been sent home to work and can't because they don't have access to broadband. So I would be good to, if you can't even elaborate today, but maybe to come back to us at some stage to give us an understanding of the work that's being done with yourself and the economy minister to intensify broadband during this time and would encourage people to, uh, to stay at home. Well, um, we've recognised for some time that rural broadband is a weakness and consequently um, our party secured £150 million pounds for, for rural broadband in particular, and a lot of that would be in for a lot of that spend will be in for Manon Rural, and I welcome that. I think that's good that those areas <coughs> who haven't benefited um, as well as others um, will have that opportunity. And uh, I think that it's critically important going forward that that is ruled out as quickly as possible. And Department of Finance, of course, are, are key players in, in, in the delivery of that. And uh, I believe that thus far um, there's been a considerable degree of cooperation um, throughout the executive on that issue. We're not going to have it delivered for the end of this crisis or for the middle of this crisis, unfortunately. Uh, one of the added um, complications is that even the, the, the providers are not allowed to go into people's homes now, so they can bring the broadband to your front door and, and, and fix you up with a plug, which, which, which you'll, you'll, you'll plug in. But that's just a further complication. But we're totally committed um, to ensuring um, that the broadband that is enjoyed by most um, can be enjoyed by that greater number um, throughout the rural community. It's going to be very difficult to achieve 100 per cent, but I believe that we can get up to 98, 99 per cent. Um, which will be a great asset. And you do rightly point out that people really need it now, just for ordering food from the shops and for simple things in life. So one of the things that, that we will be doing, and again, it's with the Department for Infrastructure, and it's great to see how the departments are working with each other. So we've been working closely with the Department for Communities, Department of Infrastructure, Department of Economy, and so forth. Um, but one of the things is that the rural transportation system, instead of taking people who are isolated to the services, it's how we can actually deliver on the rural transportation to take the services to the people and use um, those rural transportation services to do that. And I think that's crucially important at this time, that those buses um, aren't sitting there doing nothing, that they're actually used to deliver services to the rural community. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, can I just wish your family member well? Um, it's a very tough time for all of us, but it hits very close to home when it does affect us individually. Um, what I would like to say is a thank you to start off with, both to you and to um, your department for keeping things going as it currently is, and also to convey thanks on behalf of the fishing industry um, for the support package that has been put in place. Um, I've been um, 
communicating backwards and forward with NIFPO based in Porto Vogue, um, and they have said very clearly that this is a very, very welcome support to the boats, but they do have a concern, and the concern you've already mentioned earlier, um, that um, it doesn't cover the needs of the crew. Uh, many of our fishing crew are self-employed share fishermen. Most of them be live below the poverty line. As self-employed, they will be reliant on the government's self-employed income support stream. But the only unfortunate thing is we know it's going to take a bit of time for that to come through. So earlier, when you talked about support for um, the agriculture and farmers, um, I would ask you if you could consider those, those crew as well. NIFPO have concerns about, in particular, some of their foreign crew. There are 60 nationals working in uh, or for NIFPO members who are self-employed but are in the country under a transit visa. This visa is based on a reciprocal arrangement between countries and does not require that they pay tax in the UK. They 60 men have no tax history and since the collapse of our markets they have no income and no recourse to government help. And while both boats are getting some money, there was there's a, a missing of that consideration of these vulnerable crewmen um, factored into that package. Um, so there isn't just enough money to pay both the boat's bills and the crew. So I would ask if you have any sway at all, you probably with the Minister for the Economy, to seek help from HMRC and the UK Government to consider a similar scheme to the hardship scheme, for instance, being brought forward by the Minister for Communities um, for students, that we could perhaps have something up for those fishing crews in the interim until they can claim that money. And I wish you and your family a very happy Easter. Thank you. you know, the member quite rightly raises a, a very significant issue and a problem that we have. Um, our fishing industry has been supported greatly by crews from other countries. Um, that was East European, but in latter years it has become more based on Filipino and, and crews from Ghana. And they are excellent fishermen, brilliant at repairing the nets. Have bring, they're skilled people, and this is an argument that we've been having with um, the UK Department for a, a, a number of years. These people are not labourers, they're skilled fishermen and need to be recognised as skilled fishermen coming in. Uh, at this moment in time, um, certainly one section of, of, of those people do not qualify for, for the 80%, uh, and that's causing real problems and hardships. So we're aware of it. We have raised it, and we're trying to seek solutions to it, um, and I'm not sure that that's going to be simple. I am aware that quite a lot of the boats are out fishing again, and there's an intention um, to be go out later this week, because I think the weather is not suitable for them at this time, but they're intending to go out later this week, uh, which may help them to, to some extent. But the problem is that the boats themselves um, what, 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 what they're getting for, for, their, for their product is significantly down. The one good thing is that the fuel costs are also significantly down, but it doesn't compensate for the, for the, the, the amount that the actual fish is down. But with what we have offered, um, it may help to see them through over the course of the next number of months, but I, I don't see what's offered as being some magic bullet for the fishing industry. There's other issues, there's other problems, there's other complications that we need to try and assist them with and recognise that. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too thank the Minister for his statement. And I think we, we put on record our appreciation, Minister, for all your efforts in supporting the agriculture and fisheries industry at this difficult time, and all your work in ensuring that there's fresh food on the shelves of our shops and our supermarkets. And I know you've done a lot of work on that. Minister, is there any indication of reduction in the farm gate price for, for milk? Um, for farmers at this difficult time, and obviously in light of the drop in demand, for, you would we assume for milk, as processors are, are unable to carry out the work that we're doing, and our, our businesses are shut, our schools are shut, and a, and a lot of the tourist um, venues are also closed. The dairy sector is having huge problems, and there's no secret about that. <coughs> so. The, the spot price of milk has, has fallen dramatically, uh, and we're probably looking at about 15 pence a litre for, for the spot price of milk, which um, next, next month will probably be reflected in terms of what's paid to farmers. Now, it will not be as low as 15 pence, thankfully. Uh, but we're um, looking at different schemes in terms of how we could support the farming community in that. Um, there was 
12 million litres of surplus milk in the, in the UK last week. And a lot of that is down to the food processing, or the, 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 the restaurant trade disappearing. Um, for, to give you an example, um, Lakeland Dairies would have supplied all of the milk products to all of the, the airplanes or to many of the airplane companies. So whenever you open that way, so you have milk. It was milk that was produced here and across the world that was going uh, very, very successful. That's gone. So they have to readapt and try to, try to you know, change their manufacturing or their processing lines and, and to find other markets and so forth. So it's a desperately challenging time for the food processing sector. All those wee sachets of butter, nobody's buying wee sachets of butter um, to be used at home that you'd use in a restaurant or an hotel. So they're facing real critical difficulties. And the one sector in agriculture which has large debts is the dairy sector. It has traditionally been more profitable, and as a consequence of that, the banks have been more willing to lend. So having seven-figure debts is, uh, exists within the, uh, within the dairy farm sector. It is not super common, but it is not irregular either uh, for people to have debts of over a million pounds uh, and several million pounds um, who are dairy farmers. And that is going to cause real problems if milk drops off the cliff, the milk price drops off the cliff. So it is important that we are nimble and agile in terms of our response. And that's why I'd be encouraging um, the European Union to be, to be quick in its response. That's why I'd be encouraging the UK government to be quick in its response. And that's why I have been raising over the course, particularly of the last week, but, but the previous week as, as well, but in particular in the last week, of actually driving home the importance of actually responding quickly to this crisis and not allowing to develop it into a, a micro-crisis in the midst of, of the, the, the current health crisis that exists. Thank you, the Minister, uh, for a very comprehensive statement and indeed a very engaging question and answer session. Uh, Poots and Lennon just rolled off the tongue. So they're doing for, um, for you, uh, Mr. Alistair, to have the away. I thought we might have a revolution on our hands. But uh, I want to return to the, the issue of rural broadband um, and I acknowledge the investment that his department has made and also uh, the confidence in supply money, which hopefully uh, will, will be uh, honoured uh, if it hasn't been honoured to date. But the, the, in relation to single farm payments, um, the deadline is coming on the 15th of May uh, for many farmers. Uh, and considering that many will be isolated uh, uh, and rural, obviously, uh, is there an opportunity to extend that deadline uh, beyond the 15th of May? And before I end, I just want to also offer uh, my support to his relative, who is unwell, uh, and wish them a speedy and full recovery. Um, thus far, there are 6,500 people, I think, Norman told me earlier, yeah. had. Uh, have their single farm applications in, so that's very good. That's out of a million, Norman? Right, 23,000. 23, so we're sitting now with about 25 per cent in, and I, I would encourage people to, to continue to do that. And We have already offered some degree of flexibility at the end for people if they put something in and, the, uh, and they're not happy about it, they can come back and amend it uh, for a further three weeks up, to the, the, actually nearly four weeks up to the 9th of June. And we want to encourage people to, to, to do this because we are the only part of, of the UK which will be paying out in the middle of October and that's not something that we want to lose. We want to ensure that that goes to the farming community at that time. It's very important that farmers um, actually do receive their payments in October because traditionally uh, land, the Conacre land is paid for um, in October, November. So it's important to get that money into, into the farmers' accounts to allow their cash flow to work at that time of the year. So we don't really want to extend the deadline. So we'll monitor it, and, and if it's coming glaringly obvious that we're nowhere near getting, getting the numbers in that we need, then we can reappraise that situation later. But at this stage, we want to encourage people to keep working and keep getting the applications in. And if they respond to us and get their applications in, um, for the 15th of May, we'll respond to them and get the payments out for the 16th of October. <clears throat> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And, and perhaps I should start by uh, declaring an interest as a former bin man, as I echo the words of praise that uh, the Minister offered our refuse collectors. And 
If anybody's having difficulty, I'll certainly try and get the old crew together and, and pop around your house. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank the Minister for the uh, efforts he's making to ensure we have a fishing fleet at the far side of this crisis. Not just the million and a half cash, uh, but also the work with the agriculture uh, research and the data gathering. And I'm wondering if the Minister can expand on the sort of data that's being gathered and whether there is a range of potential conclusions that you have in mind. Well, um, in terms of uh, being a bin man, Mr Nesbitt, I, I will declare something in common as well, because <laughs> whenever I was at school, uh, my first job was lifting bins, which was uh, quite well paid at that time. I was very pleased with, with what we got paid. But it was real work at that time because you had to lift the old grey bin. We were very often filled with ice and put it in your shoulder. And uh, it was tough going for a 16 year old. But, uh, and the, and the, 36 the, quid a week. The, 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 the older bin men used to have a good laugh at you struggling to try and lift some, some real heavy bin as they lifted the, maybe the lighter one that, the, that, that they spotted first. But uh, anyway, those were, those were the days. In terms of what we're doing um, in AFPE and other places, uh, in research and, and work that we're providing. Uh, we intend uh, and have offered our services uh, in terms of testing, and I've done that quite early, and have the capacity to test up to 1,000 cases per day, as I indicated in the statement. And that will really assist in terms of, of getting those figures up, because once the social distancing works, and we start to see figures coming down, and this is how social distancing is, is working, folks. Before this took place, every person who had coronavirus was spreading this to 2.8 others. So in two weeks' time, if you started off with 100,000 people, you'd have 280,000. And in four weeks' time, that would be well over 700,000. So that's where coronavirus was going. As a result of social distancing, we're on minus one. So that number's coming down all of the time. And we are going to have to get out of social distancing, and the means of getting out of social distancing is to have appropriate testing. So, having adequate testing, which takes place, and recognise well, that person has already had coronavirus, they're not going to get it again, so they can go out into the workforce and all of that there. So, if we are going to get out of this, we need to have appropriate um, testing and appropriate research done. I should say that one of the other things that our department can offer and the agri-sector agri can offer, if this crisis is bad enough, is the assistance of our vet, veterinarians and hospitals. And you would say, what would somebody who treats animals know about humans? They are experts in ventilation. And if there is a pressure on in ventilation, our veterinarians can help. So just letting you know that, that if there's additional pressures put on there, and we've got the ventilation equipment, and there's staffing problems in the hospitals um, that there um, can, can be provided. I'm not sure that that's the right answer to Mr. Nesbitt's question, and, and I'm not sure if the speaker will allow him to just repeat it if I've missed something. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm happy enough, but I just wonder whether, if fleets are not fishing, does that have actually a positive impact on fish stock? In terms of fish stock, sorry, because uh, I knew there was something I hadn't quite picked up right. Um, in terms of fish stock, uh, we do have a rich supply of nephrops in uh, the RAC, um, better known as prawns to, to people who like a nice prawn cocktail before, before the notion of failure into prawn cocktail sandwiches, you know. But anyway, for, for people who. who <laughs> For people who like the prawns and so forth, we have a rich supply of, 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 of those nephrops, which are exported right around the world, and uh, you know do very well on, 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 on all of the mud and so forth in the RIC. Uh, so that, that stock is quite good. At this moment in time, we have fishermen catching haddock, um, and there's a plentitude of haddock at this time, and the, the haddock is actually better finished before it goes into um, start, starts producing um, um, or, or, or goes into the, the season uh, for laying its eggs for, for, for uh, more haddock to, to, to be created. So in all of that there we do have ample supplies of, of, of certain fish. Um, others have been challenged over the years, so the cod supply has always been something where, where, where there's been a bit of a struggle and the cod recovery programme has never really quite worked as well as it should have. 
The problem that we have in fishing is that 70% of our product is exported and 70% of the fish that we eat is imported. So we're importing cod, which is processed in China and brought here, and we're exporting our nephrops um, and crabs, which is very popular in the Far East and in China in particular. So again, you're back to this global thing. We don't eat the fish that, we're, that, that is produced locally. Uh, but all the indications are that there is still a very rich harvest of particular fish varieties to be, um, to be harvested and harvested responsibly. And the people who know best about that is the people who are out on the boats because they very quickly will notice changes and identify those changes. And it is in their interest to ensure that for them and for future generations, um, that that harvest that uh, exists in the, the RIC and beyond uh, is something which will be there for them in, in years to come. Thank you, Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for his statement and the Department as well, um, and also add my voice to, to the thanks for the vital role that the waste workers and the, the bin men offer, but also the vets and the farmers, as has been mentioned as well, but the whole host of the essential producers that I think is really evident from your, your um, words today um, come under the remit of your department. Um, and I also want to, to just note the successful intervention the Minister made when Belfast City Council announced that most of their household bin connections were to be suspended. Um, and today they're tweeting asking people to please stop fly tipping on the streets. So maybe there's a wee bit more work to be done there, but uh, it was a good intervention and thank you for that. Um, I, I, most of my questions have been uh, answered, so I maybe want to look at, I was looking at the, the access to recycling centres, trying to sort of um, predict the, the huge volume of waste, including, uh, I have to say, a lot of medical hazardous waste at the other side of, of this lockdown and this pandemic. Um, but maybe look at the agricultural waste and what's being done or what's being highlighted maybe there as well. And the Minister has made mention of, of particularly the dairy industry uh, and a lot of the, the surplus that's been left there. In your words today, you're talking about issues around carcass imbalances, about um, sales dropping and um, we're coming into lamb season, for example. Um, but what's being done to try and make sure that this produce, this surplus, isn't going to be... Um, maybe fly tipped into our rivers, for want of a better phrase, as we do already see happen from time to time in Northern Ireland, causing another further harm to people. Thank you. At this moment in time, it is a business problem as opposed to environmental problem. So there is a, a surplus of, of goods which have been already processed, uh, and those will be cold stored until there is an appropriate time to, to, to sell some of them. Uh, so there's no, that, that, that has a significant value at some point, and, and therefore that will not be, be wasted or dumped. But you do touch upon something wherein we could have a problem, an environmental problem. If our, particularly our chicken and pork processors were to hit problems, then that would lead to a consequence, and lead to a series of consequences. Consequence number one, is that that material wouldn't be available on the shelves of the supermarkets and cause problems, very significant problems, because it is chicken and pork in particular are very good value <coughs> proteins and uh, are, are, are bought by many people uh, for their families. Second problem would be that if they're not sl slaughtered in the factories, um, then they'd have to be slaughtered on farm. And how they get rid of on farm, and that creates environmental problems and creates public health problems. We cannot have farms with animals that have been slaughtered on it and not disposed of. So those are issues, and I mentioned in particular that should we hit a problem in the processors, that we have contingency. We are developing those contingencies and working on ensuring that we have contingency plans in place. But that is never a contingency that we want to use because it would be devastating um, for, the, for the farmers. It has the potential to cause public health issues, and it's something that we need to avoid at all costs. So maintaining those processing units is something which is critical. Maintaining processing units which are seeking to ensure the welfare of their workers is also critical. And so we have been having conversations with them. 
our veterinarians in particular have been working very closely in, in, because we have veterinary inspectors in the factories in terms of assisting and in, in terms of developing um, the social distancing, in terms of developing the, the kinds of PPE that, that is now in many of the factories. Um, so you have hit upon an issue that we want to really, really avoid. If milk isn't collected off farms, it will more than likely be spread in land. Um, that, that is probably okay. Certainly can't, it's not okay for it to be dumped into, into drains because it's very damaging um, if it gets into the waterways. So essentially, we need to identify solutions to ensure that we keep taking this product off farm. Because if we don't take that product off farm, we create a public health and environmental problem um, by not doing so. And um, in particular, um, the milk processors, if one of those processors was to stop, that would create massive, massive problems. If one of those pork processors was to stop, again, it would create massive problems. So that is why, over the course of the last number of weeks, I have been impressing and stressing the importance of maintaining our food processing sector, of actually been expressing public gratitude to the people who are maintaining it, because number one, they're keeping food on our shelves, number two, they're, involved, uh, they're avoiding um, a financial catastrophe for a farmer, and uh, number three, they're avoiding an environmental and public health crisis uh, for all of us that have to pick up. Speaker, and thanks uh, to the Minister for the statement. Uh, given that the, the, both the World Health Organization and the World Trade Organization have warned, and I quote, uncertainty about food availability can spark a wave of export restrictions, creating a, short, a shortage in the global market. Obviously, global food production will be severely affected if it hasn't been already by this crisis. A major issue going forward will be um, ensuring we have adequate food supplies as countries and workers are obviously forced uh, to go into lockdown. And the idea, to be frank, that it's a, a problem of panic ban, I think is, is wrong. And the minister obviously referenced um, at the start the need for flexibility, and he shared some criticisms of corporations, maybe, if you can, if you can say that. Does he share the view that um, relying on the old ways of food production and distribution uh, may not even be possible at the end of this crisis uh, in the period ahead. And does he believe that we need to have a different approach uh, to see a greater role of the state and especially his department in ensuring we have a proper plan and uh, an adequate provision are put in place so people aren't suffering from food shortages? Well, again, Northern Ireland plays its role um, way beyond its own shores. So you have a population of two billion in Africa where um, a few years ago it was one billion. And one of the means of, of, of that um, population having increased so dramatically is um, good inoculation. Uh, another one has been clean water. But obviously a population like that also needs fed. And one of the areas where we have extensive markets uh, for our powdered milk is Africa, the continent of Africa. And we are very good at producing milk. Um, we can have it dried to, to, to high specification. And uh, that is something which is a good, safe food, uh, which can go to Africa, which they could never produce enough of uh, themselves, um, given the, the harsh climate conditions that they have. A lot of that goes to China. So that is one of the reasons why our, why our sector is being hit so bad. In the rest of the United Kingdom, in, in Great Britain, a lot of the milk that is produced there goes immediately in its, in its form as pasteurised milk onto the supermarket shelves. They're less sophisticated in terms of, of, of what they actually produce, so it's, it's off the farmer's milk, pasteurised bottled onto the supermarkets. That is the majority of their, of, of their sales. The majority of our sales is your powdered milk, your butters, your cheeses, and that is largely exported. So we are much more vulnerable in Northern Ireland to that export market and that global market um, as a consequence. Uh, therein lies a problem when it comes to the dairy sector. But <clears throat> it is important that we continue to provide quality food because um, there's people in Africa and people in China um, who really benefit from it. And that's good that Northern Ireland's playing its part. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for answering all of the questions. Agenda item four is the time, date, and place of our next meeting. We have received confirmation from both the Education and Communities Ministers 
that they each want to make a statement to the ad hoc committee at a meeting to be held on Thursday, the 9th of April, here in the Assembly Chamber. The Speaker's Office will write formally to all members to confirm this. This concludes this meeting. Stay safe. God bless.